sing to Yahweh. I sing to Yahweh because he has been good to me. Come, let us sing to Yahweh. Let us raise a shout to the rock of our deliverance. Sing to Yahweh a new song. Sing to Yahweh all the earth. Sing to Yahweh, bless his name. Proclaim his deliverance from day to day. Sing to Yahweh a new song, for he has done wonders. His right hand and his set-apart arm have brought him deliverance. Sing to Yahweh with the lyre, with the lyre and the voice of a song. I sing to Yahweh as long as I live. I sing praise to my Elohim while I exist. Praise Yah. Sing to Yahweh a new song, his praise in an assembly of lovingly committed ones. Sing to Yahweh all the earth. Proclaim his deliverance from day to day. Sing to Yahweh. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Another wonderful Shabbat together in our Master's presence. And it's good to have a couple of visitors, Covenant family visitors, Alex from the UK. And Carol from Chal Tengeling. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom to Joshua and Google Air too online with us. And also Cheryl saying Shabbat Shalom to all Yam, uh, Yahweh's family as we join together to hear his living word. Renee's on. Shout out to all the set apart peoples. And Jessica saying Shabbat Shalom, everyone from the US. That's good for our family to be on. And for those that are going to join later and watch the recording, we say Shabbat Shalom to you too, as our Master continues to knit us together and cause us to be a people that can be in unity according to His Spirit. Amen. So it's been a wonderful week, I'm sure, for everybody. You're all here, all Shabbat, all Shabbat. And, uh, you know, some of you might think, just what happened this week? Went so by. And some of you think, oh, I'm so glad it's over. Whichever way it is, we're in Shabbat, we're here, and we're here not to sleep, we're here to concentrate, to give our focus fully to our Master, who continues to bless us and cause us to be a people that can work out our deliverance with fear and trembling, so we bless his name for that. So we praise Yahweh that we get the privilege, as I said, it's a gift, it's a privilege, it's an honor to be able to gather as commanded, you know, so we bless and praise his name. We're carrying on with Bamitbar. We're almost done with our journey through the wilderness. Next week, we'll look at the overview of all the stops as we uh, close out the Midbar. But this week, we're looking at a few more instructions that flow from last week of how we draw near to Yahweh. And it's Deva, uh, uh, Bamidbar numbers 30 to 32 we're doing today. So who's reading chapter 30? Are you, are you ready, Pat? Yes. Sure. And Moshe spoke to the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the word which Yahweh has commanded. When a man vows a vow to Yahweh or swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he does not break his word. He does according to all that comes out of his mouth. Or if a woman vows a vow to Yahweh, and binds herself by some agreement while in her father's house in her youth. And her father has her vow and the agreement by which she has bound herself and her father has kept silence, silent towards her. Then all her vows shall stand and every agreement with which she has bound herself stands. But if her father forbids her on the day that he has, that, that none of her vows nor her agreements by which he has bound herself stand, and Yahweh, and Yahweh pardons her because her father has forbidden her. And if she at all belongs to her husband, while bound by, by vows or by a rash utterance of her lips by which she bound herself. And her husband hears it and he, and he has kept silent towards her on the day that he hears. Then her vows shall stand 
and the agreement by which she bound herself do stand. But if her husband forbids her on the day he has it, then he has nullified her, her vow which she vowed, and the rash utterance of her lips which she bound herself, and Yahweh pardons her. But any vow of a widow or a divorced woman by which she has bound herself stands against her. And if she vowed in her husband's house or bound herself by an agreement with an oath, her husband heard it and has kept silent towards her and not forbid her, then all her vows shall stand and every agreement by which she bound herself stands. But if her husband clearly nullifies them on the day he heard, then whatever came from her lips coming concerning her lips coming her concerning, concerning her vows or or concerning the agreement binding her, it does not stand. Her husband has nullified them and Yahweh pardons her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict her being, for her husband confirms it or her husband nullifies it. But if her husband is altogether silent on the day he has, then then he confirms, but if a husband is altogether silent at, at her from, day, from, day to day. from day to day, then he confirms all her vows or all the agreements that bind her. He confirms them because he kept silent towards her on the day that he heard. But if he nullifies them after he has heard it, then he shall bear her crookedness. These are the laws which Yahweh commanded Moshe between a man and his wife, between a father and his daughter, in her youth and in her father's house. There's no sound. Sorry, I'll have to. Thank you, Joshua. They all saying, Mike, no sound, no sound. Thank you. I need to have a beep here and it like a warning light. Okay, so you hope if you didn't read my lips, I suppose I'll have to repeat myself. We're starting this Torah portion called Matot, which means tribes. And uh, who can share what I did as an introduction for the people online? Nobody was listening. Oh, we'll have to start again. Okay, no, okay, so we're flowing on from last week where we learned what it means to draw near to Yahweh. Uh, <laughs> Renee's saying, wasn't this passage about keeping silent? <laughs> Thanks, Renee. At least he's awake. He's listening. He's got ears to hear. Okay, so 
We, we looked at all the sacrifices. We know that they were always shadow pictures of the coming good matters that we have in our master, that we are able to draw near to him by his blood. But it's according to his pattern, not any which way we feel. And as we looked at last week, all the different offerings on the different feast days and even the new moons, how we see that Yahweh is quite specific in what he's deemed as an access, accessible path to him in drawing near. And there is only one way to him, and he provided that. And if we don't follow in obedience to his word, we can never truly draw near to him. And if we can't draw near to him, we'll never find favor in our time of need. So we have this boldness to come near to him because of the way that he's opened for us, that we were once not a people, but now people of Elohim. But that doesn't cause us to think we don't need to obey. In fact, it heightens our awareness of our need to obey. You know, and so as we looked at last week's Torah portion coming into this week, it's about how we love Yahweh and how we love one another. That's really what, as we see this flow in Bimitbar, that Moshe is giving instructions to this generation that's about to go and inherit their allotted inheritance in the promised land. And in this Torah portion, we see a clear picture of how we are to relate to one another, how we are to love our neighbor, so to speak, you know, and it speaks of the tribes. This portion gives us a, a clear picture as a, as a word given to all the tribes and then as a clear guidance on watching out and guarding your lips. Watch your words, so to speak, you know, and how you speak both in your commitment to Yahweh and that which you speak to one another. It has to be taken extremely seriously. You know, beware of the smooth talkers, we're told in Scripture, because they have loose lips. They'll say things and then never follow through. We should not be people like that. That's the essence of this Torah portion this week, is guarding our mouths and making sure that what we commit to, we do. Not only to Yahweh, but also to one another. First and foremost to Yahweh, you know. And so this week's Torah portion called Tribes or The Tribes, um, the text, it's Hamatot, uh, um, coming from the root word mata, matot is the plural of the word mata, which is a staff, a rod, a bride, or a branch of a vine. Coming from the verb nata, which means to stretch out or to spread or extend. And so we get this wonderful picture that our master is the vine and we're the branches. Now we can only be the branches if we've been grafted into him and are bearing fruit, because if we're not bearing fruit worthy of repentance, we'll be cut off and thrown into the fire, you know. And so this word for tribes is, is a clear picture of the tribes of Israel, the branches that are spread out, you know. And when we see the meaning of these words, we see that powerful illustration when our master in Yochanan 15 declared, I am the vine, you are the branch. And if, you stay in, if we stay in him, he stays in us and we will bear fruit that lasts. That's the promise. You know, so the instructions of Yahweh as given through Moshe to us and for us as the branches of the vine are relevant to us because if we don't obey the word of our master, we risk being fruitless and being end up like a dry tree or a dry branch that is worthless and being cut off and thrown into the fire. So this chapter starts off with this concept of vows and oaths. And as we look at this chapter, we, we, as I said, we can certainly learn a great deal of how important our words are. And therefore, we are to watch what we are saying at all times. Be, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak. Often we, we get so, and I'm not saying we generally, have you ever found at times you said stuff you shouldn't have said? Maybe out of anger or out of just frustration or whatever it is, not thinking about it, only to find out that your words trip you up no matter how you try and forget them conveniently, but it, 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 it's so important as a set-apart people. You see, the world does that, and they accept that. They, they, they're, they're not even affected by empty words. But we as a set-apart people should guard our mouths because if we're always, and we are, ambassadors of our master, we should be representing him at all times. And when our words are too loose, we're actually bringing his name to naught, you know, and so in verse 2, we see some critical uh, words that are being used here. It says, um, when, you, when a man vows a vow to Yahweh and swears an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he does not break his word. He does according to all that comes out of his mouth. Now, a couple of words that are in the Hebrew text here. The Hebrew word for vow 
is neder, which means vow, and the phrase to make a vow uh, in Hebrew is the word nada. So you have the noun and the verb. So to make a vow is nadar, uh, neder. I mean, I'm adding a uh in English there, but it's, you get the picture here. And to swear to Elohim with an oath and bind oneself with what proceeds from your mouth. Now, a neder, a vow, in Scripture is typically something that is promised to Elohim verbally. That's what we see in the pattern of the text. And anyone who makes a vow is obliged to fulfill his promise or his vow that he's uttered with his lips to Yahweh. In Scripture, a vow is always to Elohim and not to man. That's a, a powerful thing that we see. Um, and a vow carries the meaning of binding or, it, or being imprisoned to or, um, or it carries the identification of to dedicate or speci um, specify one's allegiance to a specific object or creature. And so we understand that when you are saying something to someone, you are binding yourself, you are chaining yourself in effect, you are imprisoning yourself to that which you are speaking to. Okay, that's the idea of a vow. And in Tehillah 61 verse 8, it says, So I sing praises to your name forever when I pay my vows day by day. Here we see a wonderful expression in the psalm of, you know what, I don't forget what I've committed with my lips. And as, I'm, as we're understanding that vows, scripturally speaking, are done to Yahweh, then the psalmist is declaring a powerful declaration that he doesn't go back on his word. He doesn't forget what he's spoken in a commitment to Yahweh. Because you know how many people, typically when they're in a bind, they'll promise Yahweh everything if he just sorts them out, you know, treat him like a genie, you know, that, that's witchcraft. And they quickly promise him everything. I'll do this if you do that for me. And when Yahweh comes through for them, they quickly forget what they committed with their lips. But here the psalmist is saying, I pay my vows day by day. They don't linger. They don't wait for a a day where I've forgotten, oh, I'm supposed to do this, you know, um, I'm doing it day by day. Tehillah 116 verse 14 says, I pay my vows to Yahweh now in the presence of all his people. So in other words, we're not undercover agents. So we are living out what we've declared to Yahweh in a vow. And I'm doing it before the lovingly committed ones because I'm showing what I've declared and made a bold confession with my mouth in my belief by what I do, and everyone else should be able to see it. You know, we, we'll, we, we're reading as part of this week's Torah commentary the words of Messiah from Matit Yohu 5, verse 33, when he says, you know, you shall not swear falsely, but perform your oath to Yahweh. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. And so this can cause us to recognize the truth of how our words are so important. What comes forth from our lips is extremely important, you know, and then we look at oaths. So you have vows and oaths in Scripture. The Hebrew word for oath is shavua, which means an oath, a curse, to swear or sworn. And it comes from the root word sheva, which is, actually carries the number seven. And as we know in Scripture, seven represents completion. So it's, it's fitting that this from, and coming from the verb shava, which means to swear or exchange or take an oath or make a vow, then we understand the concept of seven because it's bringing to completion what's already been declared. You know, so, so it's a powerful witness here. So even every Shabbat, you know, there remains this entering into his rest. So even us guarding the Shabbat as we should, as a cyclical pattern, we are completing that which we've already committed to him to follow him. But when we neglect, we sang the song, Remember the Sabbath. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's part of the 10 words that he gave to the entire nation to set it apart. But how many people quickly forget when they said that I do to Yahweh and they quickly forget a Shabbat? You know, they think they do, they, 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 oh yeah, they work out their own thing, cut corners, and I'll just do this, and you know, Yahweh understands, no, no, you forgot your commitment as a bride to Yahweh when you break the Sabbath, you know? Now, an oath, as opposed to a, a vow that's done to Yahweh, an oath is an obligation that's taken upon oneself rather than that which is imposed upon you. So people will actually take the responsibility to say, you know what, I'm saying this, I'm not, nobody's forcing me to make this commitment. I'm doing it by myself. That's, a, that's the power. To swear in Scripture is to give one sure and promised word and commitment to follow through what you're committing to, you know. And you would faithfully perform 
the promised deed that you said you would do. And as a result of this also, it's a refraining from the evil acts that you once did. That's also part of our oaths that we make as a declaration of set-apartness before our master. Occasionally in Scripture we see that one uh, um, swore that they freely acknowledged the truth and would continue to acknowledge it in the future by sticking to what they heard. That's why Yeshua says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he asked his taught ones, do you now understand? They said yes. So by that implication, with their verbal acceptance on their mouths, they are swearing to actually follow through with the teachings. And we've all done that. The question is, are we following through or are we forgetting what we've uttered from our lips as an oath, as a vow of commitment? And in Hebrew, when one promises to complete something in a, in a scriptural Hebraic mindset, it's considered to be done. And the word that one had promised could be depended upon. As true set-apart believers, we are to be people that our brothers and sisters ought to take us at our word. Mm. You know, we can say, mm. I know we all agree with that, but are we doing it? That's the question when we look into the mirror of the word today. It's important for us to grasp because there are so many people breaking their word breaking their commitment that they made even when they passed through the waters in declaring that they are now died to self, they're, they're brought to new life and resurrection power of our master by his spirit, they now belong to him, and then they quickly, they live a lifestyle that promises things to others in the body and then break their word. That's breaking your vow to Yahweh and breaking your oath to others, that you, which you bound yourself by. This is a very serious thing to be on guard against. And what we recognize is that when one makes a promise, in a sense, it is incomplete until it is completed. And you know, a lot of times people say stuff just to get people off their backs. And don't realize that what they've said, just to get somebody away from them because you keep bugging me, you know, well, it's, it's incomplete in you until you complete it. Scripture talks about it is sin in you until it's accomplished. So the lawful thing to do is to do what you say. Now, never, do so, never say something that you shouldn't do. That's the other lesson that we, we learn from this. You know, When we swear by his name, we are identifying ourselves as his betrothed covenant family, his bride, his called out set apart ones. And we are identifying yourself with ourselves with his character and the witness of who Yahweh is as a light to the nations. And therefore, we are committing to follow the clear standards of set-apartness that is prescribed for us in the Torah. And therefore, Yahushua warns us that we are not to swear falsely. Because when we swear by his name, and it's not you might not say, I swear by his name, but your acknowledgement that you belong to Yahweh, that you're a set-apart one, you are, in essence, swearing by his name, which is supposed to be on you. And when you don't follow through in complete set-apartness and you cut corners, you're swearing falsely. Have you ever thought about it like that? You're bearing false witness. Vayikro Leviticus 19 verse 12 says, And do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of Yahweh your Elohim. I am Yahweh what he's saying very clearly here. And this was before they heard the 10 words. This was when they said yes, that Yahweh said, if you obey my voice, then you will be a treasured possession, a set-apart people, you know, a royal priesthood. Conditional clause. And the entire nation said, yes, we will do, before they even heard the conditions of this marriage. In Shemot, um, or this is Vayikra. But in Shemot 19, they said that I do. And here comes the warning in Vaikra, which is all about drawing near to Yahweh. We've been through that book. Yahweh's saying, you want to draw near to me? We just spoke about last week, the sacrifices are as a picture of drawing near to him. Okay, so it's one thing to gain access. But now how do you live your life? So we see this flow in the Torah given to us, you know. And to not swear falsely in Yahweh's name is a serious instruction. As so many people do this, as they pass off their own agendas and ideas as that of Yahweh, doing what's right in their own eyes. It also speaks of not fulfilling something that one has been uh, as committed or declared to complete. And now we have all said, 
we will follow his commands. We've all said, we're all sitting here, because if we, if we didn't, we wouldn't be sitting here today. We wouldn't be together, you know. We've all committed to a relationship with our master. And we've all committed to accepting the fact that his life, death, and resurrection is what gives me the ability to live with the expectation of an eternal life with him, but a responsibility to live right now in everything that I say and everything that I think and everything that I do. Whatever we do, whether in word or deed, we are to do it in the name of Yahushua Messiah. So when anything that you are doing or saying or even thinking cannot have his name attached to it as a representation of the creator and redeemer of mankind, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yahushua Messiah reiterates this command by saying that we should not swear falsely by anything, but we should let our yes be yes and our no, no. Don't give your word and then break it. Now, I might sound repetitive today because it's for emphasis, because, you know, as, as fleshly beings, we often find that we are hard of hearing or we quickly forget when circumstances aren't as favorable as we'd like them to be. And this is why we go every week through the Torah, because we have to be reminded, we have to have ears to hear and guard ourselves from falling asleep to the proper representation of the character and set apartness of Yahweh that we are called to be as lights in this world. You know, the Hebrew word that's translated as bind himself. So when binds himself by an oath, as I said, this idea of vows and oaths, binding yourself, you're attaching yourself to either Yahweh or the person that you are making an agreement with. And it comes from the root word asar, which means to tie, bind, imprison, yoke, or hitch. And in fact, it has the meaning also of being joined in battle. How awesome is that? From a positive aspect of a body that is to walk in unity together. The understanding of a vow and oath is that we make a binding or imprisoning of one to another. And the Hebrew word that's translated as himself is nefesh. It's the living being. It's who you are, you know. It's the person, the appetite, the, 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 the passion, the emotion. And that's why we, we highlight this, because people often make rash words when from a, a, an emotional point of view and find themselves realizing that actually they shouldn't have said what they said. Shalomo gives us a clear, you know, we, we all learn. And this isn't a license to now just go and make things and promises and, and uh, quickly break them. But he does, uh, um, I just want to get to that. In, in Mishle 6, these are all parables. And Shalomo gives us one. He says, my son, if you become guarantor for your friend, have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, have been, have been snared by the words of your own mouth, have been caught by the words of your mouth, do this at once. And deliver yourself, for you have come into the hand of your friend. Go humble yourself and urge your friend. Give no sleep to your eyes, nor slumber to your eyelids. Deliver yourself like a gazelle from the hunter's hand and like a bird from the hand of the trapper. This is a parable of when you realize that you've spoken something wrong and that you've realized, you don't say, oh, I'll leave it. I'll see him when I see him in a month's time and, or in a day's time. Go now. Don't give sleep to your eyes. Don't just pass it off. Sort it out now so that you don't get caught like a bird in a trap. It can't get out, you know. One of the other meanings of the word bind, asar, is yoke. And it further emphasizes how our words yoke us to another. And that's why we are to have no agreement with Belial. That's why we are not to make a covenant. In Shemot 23, verse 32, it says, Do not make a covenant with them, nor with their mighty ones. And we are also un to understand that we are, Shaul reminds us to the assembly in Corinth that we are, have no, what, ha what has the agreement of Messiah with Belial? Mm -hmm. You know, and we are really got, we have to be on guard against what we are committing ourselves to in promising things to other people, you know. We understand that we're in the world and we're not of the world and we certainly have to make commitments at times to those that are not in the Torah, be it our employers or clients or work colleagues, from a work-relatable thing. What I'm stressing here is that we must make sure that we do our utmost not to make promises or agreements 
with those outside of the Torah that will cause us or require us to break the Torah. Somebody's alarm is going off. Can we sort that out? Beep, 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 beep. And so, you know, one of the examples we often use and we often tell people as they're coming on this walk, you know, and maybe they're seeking new employment, when one goes for a job interview and they receive new employment, they have to make sure from the start that they cannot work on the Sabbath and Feast of Yahweh. Okay, sorry, there's still an alarm going off. Is it from outside? No, it's some inside here. It's either a watch or a phone. Very good, but he doesn't need to go out. We can listen. Okay. Okay, so we see a wonderful warning to us here against breaking our words, you know, and being careful what we are saying with our lips. Um, the instruction is clear. A man must not break his word because when you do that, you're profaning the name of Yahweh. And one of the things that we see here, we, when we enter into any kind of agreement with others, whether it's an employment contract, whether it's, whether it's commitment to doing work, we have to make sure that we are not binding ourselves in an agreement that will cause us to break the Torah in any shape or form. Because then you should not be entering into that contract or that agreement. When I say contract, this is how, have you ever realized that your words are a contract? Just because it's not on paper, it's a contract. You know? And you know, there's lots of movements today that are trying to get out of responsibilities. The fact is, when you agree to something, it doesn't matter what they're doing in error. If you've agreed to something, you need to keep your side. We need to understand that. That's why you submit to all authorities. You don't reject the authority because you're not getting your way and then try and get out of something that you actually committed to and used the benefits of, now trying to relinquish responsibility. It doesn't work like that. And there's a big move in the world today to promote that. That's not set apartness. We are to be lights in this world. We are to show how we can live as true lights in this world when we commit to what comes forth from our mouths and not forget what we committed to. But if we find that what we committed to actually breaks the word, we must be in haste to go and rectify whatever we can. It might mean losing a contract. It might mean losing work or whatever as part of the consequence of making right wrong words. You know, and in Hebrew, the word profane means to bore to pieces or kill or wound or violate or pollute or defile. You know, all very striking words that define what profaning is in the Hebraic mindset. And this is what I think people often don't realize is that when they break their word, it's a, it's a defiling. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a violation of a relationship that you claim to have with Yahweh. And when Israel did this by joining themselves to Baal and whoring with the nations and bowing to their foreign mighty ones, it was a violation against the marriage contract that Yahweh said to the house of Israel, I issue you a certificate of divorce. Renee's asking, is Graram profane? I don't know what's Graram. Maybe you're thinking of Haram. Haram is to put under the ban. Um, that's not profane. Profane is halal. Remember we spoke about the, how did I do my, my H the other day? The, the, the gap, the little gap, the gap, the little gap. So halal, which is to praise, which is a hey, lamet, lamet. Halal, which is a chiet, lamet, lamet. And the difference in the Hebrew letters is it looks like a, a, a doorpost, if you did it like two, a lintel and two doorposts, but the hey has a little gap between it and the chiet is no gap. Okay, so it's almost that little gap, the difference between praising and profaning, you know, and this is, that's a fine line that many people often neglect to recognize, you know, um, and so in Ecclesiastes or Echa 5 verse 4, it says, when you make a vow to your Elohim, do not delay to pay it, for he takes no pleasure in fools, pay that which you have vowed. How, how powerful is this, you know? Mishle 20 verse 25 says, it's a snare for a man to say rashly, it is set apart and only later to reconsider his vows. 
you know, people will you know, think, of, you know, I, we could spend hours here and I, I hope I'm not going to drag it out too long. I want you to understand and meditate on this because this isn't just a few words. Oh, this is what these guys did then. This is a, a mirror for us as a lesson on guarding what we've committed to. And we've all made a commitment to Yahweh. And when people say it's set apart, you know, that of course, it's a bold declaration like Israel at Mount Sinai. Yes, 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 we are. When Yahushua entered into the promised land, he was about to die. And he says, for me and my house, we serve Yahweh. You know, you guys choose who you're going to serve today. No, we serve him. He says, no, you've got to make sure. And he said, yeah. And he said, you are witness against yourselves. So when we make a commitment to Yahweh, we become a witness against ourselves. When we don't follow through to putting Yahweh first. Always. There are so many people today that commit to Yahweh. And what happens when things either go very good or very bad, Yahweh takes a backseat because they have to feed the things of the flesh first. And that is breaking one's vow, violating your relationship with your Redeemer and Savior. You know? Yes. Um, right now, I, you said their food is halal. Yes. Praise. Yes. The same as we talked about the root language being the same. Now they call whatever they're not allowed to have haram, yeah. which is under the ban. Yes. So you can say something is under the ban for you. It's not fit for you. Yeah. Yes. We would say halal. They say haram. Yeah. So it has the same kind of connotation. Yeah. When we say something, we must be ready to follow through, regardless of the circumstances. You know, unless it's breaking, we real, if we realize we shouldn't have said that, then we still got to follow through by making sure that we correct what we've said in error, even if it costs you, you know. When we say, I mean, it's a nice thing to think about this. I mean, when we think of haram, to put under the ban that, that Renee was bringing up, and halal, to profane and how the modern day language even of the Muslim community has those sounding words which help us also realize is, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, uh, enemy in their words kind of thing. It's similar words. So it carries the idea either halal to praise or haram to uh, profane or to put under the ban or not acceptable for praise because our life is a praise to Yahweh, you know. And so when we also think that when we say to Yahweh that you are my savior, I'm dead to self, I belong to you, I'm putting you first. Therefore, that's why everything that is not of Yahweh should be put under the ban. That's one of the things we learn through the Torah portions too, you know. And putting under the ban at times means to destroy it completely out so it has no effect on your lives. Other times it doesn't mean literally to destroy it, but it actually means that it's not for use to you. For instance, you don't destroy your tithes. Because that tithes are haram, they're put under the ban. You don't destroy them, but they're not for you to use. They're for Yahweh. And when you when you use that, you're violating your relationship with Yahweh. It's just a small example that we we see in terms of the halal and the haram and the um, making rash commitments with one's mouth. You know, we we see a. a clear witness in Scripture, and we went through his example a few weeks ago um, of a person that commits to keeping the word to Yahweh, and that's with Yiftach. Remember Yiftach, and he, he promised that whatever comes out of his house, and his daughter came out, and he, he gave his daughter to her. Here, we're not going to go in depth into, um, so, sorry, he gave his daughter to Yahweh, sorry. Um, we're not going to go in depth into that because it should be fresh in your minds, I still, I, I hope, still is. Um a great example for us. But one of the things that we, we see here, when Shalomo says, it's, it, you know, if one says rashly with their lips making a vow and then reconsider it, that Hebrew word for reconsider, bakar, means to seek, inquire, make inquiry, meditate. In other words, we have to consider our words before committing to them or making those words verbal as an expression of commitment. You first have to, that's why Yeshua gives us the parable of the man when he's building a tower, he sits down and he calculates. Think first before you speak, you know. Meditate. Think about what you're doing so that what you commit to, you can fulfill and follow through. Another thing we have to realize is that vows don't need to be vocalized in order for them to be in effect. Have you ever thought about it like that? As soon as we say it in our hearts, 
Yahweh knows and expects us to keep it. And the, a, a renewed writings example is given very clearly to us in Acts 5 with Kanania and Shapira, who lied to the set-apart spirit about the price they got when they sold their field and brought it to the emissaries. And they both were struck dead. You see, nobody forced them to sell the field, but they just wanted to be seen because Barnabas had sold the field and brought everything. Said, here, I'm giving it to you. There was no, it wasn't, you all must go sell your fields and bring, but they wanted to do that. And Anya and Shapira, they thought, hey, let us look also like we're doing that, but we'll keep some back. It's a valuable lesson on trying to be uh, um, looking the part before others, but actually keeping back the full commitment of what you should be committing to. That's already lying to Yahweh, and Yahweh sees it because man looks at the eyes, but Yahweh at the heart. So it digs a little deeper into our lives to say, gee whiz, you know, we got to think. And I mean, I know we have thoughts, and that's why you count, you meditate, you think about it. And it's good to reason out with Yahweh, but when you've committed to something to follow through already and you're about to do it, it's already been done inside you. Yahweh sees that and expects that to, to, to be done. Or reconsider, calculate, and do what's right with your meditation and seeking of him, you know. When you make a vow to Yahweh your Elohim, do not delay to pay it. It's Devarim 23, verse 21 to 23. For Yahweh your Elohim is certainly requiring it of you, and it shall be sin in you. There's the one verse that I was highlighting, how your vow will be sin in you. But when you abstain from vowing, it is not sin in you. That makes sense, okay? That which has gone from your lips, you shall guard and do. For you voluntarily vowed to Yahweh your Elohim what you have promised with your mouth. So today we are all reminded of what we committed before many witnesses when we said the I do to Yahweh. You know? Our master reminds us that the good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart and the wicked bring forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every idle word that men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous, and by your words you shall be declared unrighteous. In other words, the power, life and death is in the power of the tongue. And we should be making sure that we are not proclaiming a death sentence of judgment because we are speaking rashly with our lips. You know? And what our master was basic, he wasn't nullifying the Torah when he said, let your yes be yes and your no, no. What he was highlighting here, he says, don't swear falsely. Or vainly, you know. And so one thing that we see today is that people like to keep their options open by saying, maybe. Commit to it. I mean, it's okay to say, listen, can I go think about it and can I give you an answer later today or tomorrow? That's still a commitment, but then make sure you give the answer by the time. But don't say, yeah, maybe, 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 you know. People don't want to offend, so they say, oh, I'll see, maybe. It feels like, the world has trained people that you, you, shouldn't, you can't say no, otherwise you're a bad person. You must always just say yes. And especially as we are living as set-apart ones in a common world, in a profane world, there are many things we are to be saying no to, and it needs to be no. Don't say no and end up when, you know, no, I'm not going to do that, and you make the confession before others, and meanwhile in the week you're going and you're doing the things you'd say no to because then you've sworn falsely in your commitment to live set-apart lives to Yahweh, you know? So here we see a wonderful uh, um, picture here of our words. And one of the things that we take note of here is that this vows and agreements, the rest of the chapter carries the, the lesson on the vows and agreements that a woman uh, uh, makes, either while she's in her father's house under the father's authority or when she's under her husband's authority. And so we see um, some wonderful lessons here of order in the house because it's always a picture that the the man of the house should always be aware of what's happening in the house and take authority over that which is being committed to and when the father or husband hears something that's spoken and he doesn't say anything he's accepting what's being spoken and therefore giving the okay and everything will stand and it will be she, she, um, that woman will be bound by what she's spoken but if in the day that he hears he nullifies it, whether the husband or the father. Then it's nullified, and the, then the, the, the woman that's made or the daughter that's made that commitment is released from it. 
But then it carries on and it goes on and it gives an interesting text here because it says here, um, every vow and every binding oath to afflict her being, let her husband confirm, let her nullify. But if her husband is altogether silent at her from day to day, he confirms it. He confirms the vows and the agreements that bind her. I mean, that makes sense. We, we see that. Um, he confirms because he kept silent to her on the day that he heard. He might not have heard it the day she spoke it, but the day he heard about it, which might be a day later, a week later, whatever, he keeps quiet. It's fine. Carries on because he's the one that has the authority to accept or nullify. But it also highlights a proper communication that ought to be in a marriage. A woman ought to not, you know, the Jezebel spirit goes out and makes commitments without telling her husband. A relationship is supposed to scripturally, when we're in walking in the truth, we're supposed to reflect a marriage between a creator and his creator. That's the mystery. So therefore, you know, I, we, we, uh, the proper pattern of a marriage is transparency. So a wife shouldn't be going off making promises and commitments without her husband's knowledge, actually. You know, and so in the day that he hears, so this is all in the context of a covenant relationship with Yahweh and a, and a covenant of people. And he says, but if he nullifies them after he has heard, this is very important, then he shall bear her crookedness. Now, the Hebrew word after is behind pa'achar, which is behind pa or left over. So the idea that we get here, because it's very clear the rest of the text, when he keeps quiet, it's accepted. When he nullifies it, it's nullified. In the day he hears it, but if he, after he hears it, in other words, he's heard it, he kept quiet, but now he comes and nullifies it, then he bears her crookedness. Because obviously what happens is if he kept quiet, now she goes out and carries on with that, but then he nullifies it, he's the one that's going to bear the consequences because he didn't speak up when he should have. So this is a powerful witness of Messiah for us as his bride. Because we see this wonderful shadow picture being laid out for us because when our master was brought before Pilate, he kept quiet. And he marveled at why he kept quiet. And so here we see also in text how we see a powerful witness of he has borne our crookednesses. So all the wrong things that we made in commitment, in error, by his life, death, and resurrection that we now commit to, he bears our crookednesses. And causing everything that we did in error to now be cleansed. But here's the warning. Once you have now been cleansed and redeemed, make sure that you're not being rash with your vows and your oaths by the one who has removed your crookedness. You know? One of the things here, Yeshiyahu 53 verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, but he did not open his mouth. And in Yeshayahu 53, verse 11, the same chapter, he says, he would see the result of the suffering of his life and be satisfied. Through, the knowledge, through his knowledge, my righteous servant makes many righteous, and he bears their crookednesses. We have this picture here of what he's done for us, and now a responsibility we have to making sure that as a bride of Messiah, as part of that bride joined together, we are to be open in our commitment to him and not trying to go and make commitments outside of his relationship with us that he bought at a price. That make sense? Hebrews gives us a clear warning. Remember I said, when you make a vow, it remains sin in you until it's completed. Hebrews 10 verse 26 says, if we sin purposefully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a slaughter offering for sins, but some fearsome anticipation of judgment and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponents. In other words, when people aren't walking in the truth and obeying the word, that have tasted the heavenly gift, that have sinned purposefully, why that sinned purposefully, today we are all sitting here in agreement. We've heard this Torah. We have to watch what goes out from our mouths. Because when we go and commit something with our mouth, it remains sin in us till it's completed. And if we go purposefully and make rash vows and oaths, there isn't a slaughter offering to remove the crookedness. But there's just fearsome anticipation of judgment. Because when you go and you are too loose with your lips, you are an opponent to Yahweh. 
Anybody want to share their thoughts on this chapter? I do think we can often just read quickly through this chapter and think, oh, here's a thousand hours. It's not for me. I only do that when the lawyer's left. And no, it comes deeper than that. It's your every word, which begins with your every thought. That's why blessed is he who meditates on the Torah day and night. In other words, we put the helmet of deliverance on. We're not just letting our mind wander off. We are taking captive every thought and subjecting it to Messiah. That's the life of a true set-apart bride of Messiah. Understand that everything you do in life is worship. Yes. And you won't distinguish anymore between physically making a vow and just saying yes and no. Yeah. But you see that it's all a reflection of who you are in Messiah. Yeah. yeah. And that's the big thing is integrity gets lost very quickly when you don't keep your word. And if you don't keep your word before those in the world, how will they ever draw near to the light that you are supposed to be shining? You know? I think one of the uh, things that you were touching on with all the things that's happening in the world today, and we see so much injustice and evil and all those kind of things and by just being quiet about it uh, inadvertently then agreeing with that and letting it happen and not speaking up like we should the the, the terrible consequences that flows from that is is absolutely horrendous and so when we speak up in truth and in in the right context in the right way then that is our obligation, all of us, to always do that. Because if we stay silent, we are making a, that bind with the falseness that's in the world. Well, look, there's a, there's a bit of a balance here. Today we're also looking at Yirmiyahu and what he was instructed to gird up his loins and speak that which Yahweh has commanded. So there's the balance of we're living in this world. There is evil. It's corrupt. It's, and Yahweh is in control. He's allowed this evil to rule because of the corruption of man. But he's got a set-apart bride that lives according to a standard of his Torah. And this is what we are to stand on in our representative. We don't stand out with placards. That's not. You don't join a crowd to do evil. So you don't join yourselves with others that aren't in Yahweh to speak out against what the world is doing. We don't go and speak out. Yahweh fights for us. What we stand up for is the truth. And what we are to be as watchmen on the walls is for one another in covenant. That's the pattern we get in Scripture. We should be warning one another. That's why we don't judge those outside. Yahweh judges them, but we are to judge one another inside. So our responsibility for speaking up the truth, no. That's why Yahweh makes it very clear to Israel, do not be joined to them. Don't worship the way that they do. He's not saying go out and tell them what they're doing is wrong. He never said that at all. Never in Scripture. He just says, don't do what they do. Don't join yourselves to them. Joining means participating and, and being part of that. Now, we're in this world. We have to trade. We have to do things and work. But that's not a joining in their practice of worship because we can, in everything we do, in word or deed, in our work, we always represent who we are worshiping. Now, we'll come into contact, like Shaul and all of them did, in Rome and in Turkey and all the Asia Minor the Decapolis that was the other side of the river or the, the sea, they all came into contact with people that weren't living a covenant lifestyle. They would go to markets that weren't living according to the Torah. But how we live and how Shaul also teaches us in many of his letters in the renewed writings is that we are to do what we know we ought to do and stand up for that. Obviously, if you don't want to do what they do, it will be a witness yes. to mm -hmm. them that what they're doing is wrong. But we have to warn our fellow brothers when you use this judgment. He says he judges those outsiders. But your lifestyle should be a mirror in their face without you having to. Yeah. But obviously, if you come in with someone and they're doing wrong dealings, you can say what you're doing isn't right. Yes. But if he's not holding himself to the same standard, like we said, this is our standard, you always work, then you're going to speak to a wall. You're going to say, well, I don't agree with the word. You know what I mean? I think the key thing is it's not, that's not what I do. Yeah. And therefore, this is what I do. And so even when they were going out to the nation, some were receiving the good news, some were rejecting it. You, you know, and even when Shaul went to the, the Areopagus, where they just wanted to hear the latest philosophy, the latest conspiracy, and they were all there, and they had 
mighty ones to everyone, even an unknown one. He says, let me tell you about the unknown one. He wasn't telling him, hey, all these other ones are terrible and wrong. I mean, they are terrible and wrong. And he says, but let me tell you about the one you don't know. Mm. Then they wanted to hear him the next week. And then after, they didn't want to hear him. They chucked him out, you know. So it's not to go and necessarily go and, and be against verbally what the world is doing in error. We are to be a light to the nations of what the right way is. And when people are inquiring, we are to warn them against those wrong ways. Like we're in a, a season now. I don't even like to call it silly season. It's a terrible season in the world, a dark season where false worship is going on and it's supposedly being attributed to the creator of Scripture. And it's done in error. That's a, 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 a joining to Belial that they've done, which is not a joining at all. And so we can warn our brothers and sisters who claim, as Kalina is saying, you know, one of the things that we often do is that if somebody wants to, one of the things as part of our words as well is we should not engage in battles over the Torah. We shouldn't get into debates over matters of the Torah. Shaul warns Timotheus about this. Because we discuss the Torah among ourselves. We don't go out there and we fight with somebody uh, that's not in the Torah about the Torah. That, that's a waste of time, Shaul said. When somebody claims that their standard, their foundation is Scripture or the Bible, that's when we can enter into a discussion. Okay, But when it starts going off into verbal battles about the Torah, we should stop it straight away because it's actually fruitless. You know, So there's always this um, uh, awareness of when we should speak, when we shouldn't speak. Shal Shalomo gives the parable of, you know, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest you become like him. And don't answer a fool according to his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own eyes. You know, whichever way. The other way around. <laughs> answer a fool in his folly, lest he becomes wise in his own eyes. Don't answer a fool in his folly, lest you become like him. So it's like, well, when am I supposed to answer? When am I not supposed to answer? That takes growth and wisdom in the word. You know, so there's, there's always that balance. You know, so... The main thing is never to participate in any kind of false worship. Yeah. That's how you actually mm. right action. Yeah. Yes. We'd like to read chapter 31 because it, it flows on from what we're talking about here. And we learn how we distress the strife. Okay. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe saying, Take vengeance for the children. Take vengeance for the children of Israel on the Midianites. After that, you are to be gathered to your people. And Moshe spoke to the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves for the campaign, and let them go against the Midianites to take vengeance for Yahweh on Midian. Send a thousand from each tribe of all the tribes of Israel for the campaign. So there were supplied from the tribes of Israel, one thousand from each tribe, twelve thousand armed ones for the campaign, and Moshe sent them... <coughs> On the campaign, 1,000 from each tribe, them and Pinchas, son of Eleazar the priest, on the campaign with the set-apart utensils and the trumpets for sounding in his hand. And they fought against the Midianites, as Yahweh commanded Moshe, and killed all the males. And they killed the sovereigns of Midian with the rest of those who were pierced, Eve and Rechem and Sur and Hur and Riva, the five sovereigns of Midian, and they killed Bilam, son of Peor, with a sword. And the sons of Israel took all the women of Midian captive and their little ones and took as spoil all their livestock and all their possessions. And they burned with fire all the cities which they, where they dwelt and all their settlements. And they took all the spoil and all the booty, both of man and beast. And they brought the captives and the booty and the spoil to Moshe and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the children of Israel to the camp of the desert plains of Moab by the Yarden of Jericho. And Moshe and Eleazar the priests and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. But Moshe was wroth with the officers of the army, with the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, who had come from the campaign. And Moshe said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, they are the ones who caused the children of Israel through the word of Bilam to trespass against Yahweh in the matters of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of Yahweh. And now kill every male among the little ones, and every woman who has known a man by lying with a man, you shall kill. But keep alive for yourselves all the female children who have not known a man by lying with a man. 
and you camp outside the camp seven days. Whoever has killed any being and whoever has touched any slain, cleanse yourselves and your captives on the third and on the seventh day, and cleanse every garment and every object of leather and all the work of goat's hair and every object of wood. And Eleazar the priest said to the men of the campaign who went to the battle, This is the law of the Torah which Yahweh commanded Moshe. Only the gold and the silver and the bronze, the iron, the tin and the lead, every object that passes through fire, you put through the fire, and it shall be clean. Only let it be cleansed with the water of uncleanness. And whatever does not pass through the fire, you pass through water. And you shall wash your garments on the seventh day and be clean, and afterward come into the camp. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Count up the plunder that was taken, of man and of beast, you and Eleazar the priest and the heads of the fathers of the congregation, and you shall divide the plunder into two parts, those who took part in the battle. And you shall divide the plunder into two parts, between those who took part in the battle, who went out on the campaign, and all the congregation, and set aside a levy for Yahweh on the men of battle, who went out on the campaign, one out of every five hundred of men and of cattle and of the donkeys and of the sheep. Take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as a contribution to Yahweh. And from the children of Israel's half you shall take one of every fifty of men and of cattle and of donkeys and of the sheep of all the livestock and give them to the Levites according to the duty of the dwelling place of Yahweh and give them to the Levites, guarding the duty of the dwelling place of Yahweh. And Moshe and Eleazar the priest did as Yahweh commanded Moshe. And the booty remaining from the plunder, which the people of the campaign had taken, was 675,000 sheep, and 72,000 cattle, and 61,000 donkeys, and 32,000 human beings in all, of women who had not known a man by lying with a man. And the half, the portion for those who went out on the campaign was in number 337,500 sheep, and the levy unto Yahweh of the sheep was 675. And the cattle were 36,000, of which the levy unto Yahweh was 72, and the donkeys were 30,500, of which the levy unto Yahweh was 61. And the human beings were 16,000, of which the levy unto Yahweh was 32 beings. So Moshe gave the levy which was the contribution unto Yahweh to Eleazar the priest, as Yahweh commanded Moshe. And from the children of Israel's half, which Moshe divided from the men who campaigned, now the half belonging to the congregation was 337,500 sheep and 36,000 cattle and 30,500 donkeys and 16,000 human beings. Then Moshe took from the children of Israel's half, one out of every fifty, drawn from man and beast, and gave them to the Levites, who guarded the duty of the dwelling place of Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moshe. And the officers who were over thousands of the campaign, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds, came near to Moshe, and they said to Moshe, Your servants have taken account of the fighting men under our command, and not a man of us is missing. So we have brought an offering to, for Yahweh, what every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets and bracelets and signet rings and earrings and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before Yahweh. And Moshe and Eleazar the priests received the gold from them, all the fashioned ornaments. And all the gold of the offering that they presented to Yahweh from the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds were 16,750 shekels. The men of the campaign had taken spoil every man for himself. And Moshe and Eleazar the priest received the gold from the commanders of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tent of appointment as a remembrance for the children of Israel before Yahweh. Okay, so this chapter is very clear. Yahweh said to Moshe, take vengeance on the Midianites. This was a very clear instruction that Moshe was given before he would be gathered to his people. In other words, before you die, distress the Midianites. And that is a clear instruction that we see in, in uh, Hebrew. It's a, a repetition of the root word nakam, but it's written as nekam nikmath, which means take vengeance. 
So you've got this clear uh, um, verb and noun being used together. And basically, an instruction is punish with a vengeance. Okay, whenever a root word we see being used twice in a row with a verb and a noun, it's used for emphasis. It really is punish with a vengeance. In other words, give them no space to breathe, cramp their style. And this is what we learn from this today is that the actions that were being called for here were extreme actions as these were a people who seduced Israel to whore away from Yahweh, to go whoring after Baal. You know, and this, um, following on from last week when, when we read from Chazon, one of the, uh, I know Renee was saying, where was it that, you know, Bilam taught the people? And we read from Chazon, and here in this chapter again, it's very clear that, look, they are the ones who caused the ch children of Israel, this in verse 16, through the word of Bilam to trespass against Yahweh. It's another text to show that Bilam taught them. Couldn't curse them. No matter how many seminars they had and conferences they had on different heights and extravagant slaughtering shows, they couldn't curse Yahweh's unsuspecting people among the nations. But how he could get to this unsuspecting people was through whoring. Get the women in and lure them away. And then Moshe is given the clear instruction, you distress them, you take vengeance on them. Because you, when, if, if, if Moshe had gone, it would even have been a bigger kind of threat. And this is a valuable lesson how without the Torah, we can't put to death that which can cause us to whore away from Yahweh. So when people say the Torah is no longer applicable, they are opening a huge door for them to be affected by whoring and to not stray, stay true, to stray or not stay true to the covenant of marriage with our Redeemer. You know? Listen, listen. Don't be talking about you made the covenant. You should agree on the term. Yes. If we don't all agree on the term of the covenant, what is the standard going to be? Yeah. Because then everyone has to decide for himself what to stand. Yeah. And we have in Scripture a clear witness of what that looks like when everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Because what, doing what's right in your own eyes is evil in Yahweh's eyes. You know? And so what we learn from this today is better understood when we see the meaning of what Midianite is. Midianite, um, coming from the, the word Madon, means strife or contention. And we can understand that the Midianites were people of strife. And when the Torah or Moshe instructs us that we must not give room, we must not give breath to strife, then we have to see that we have to make sure that we are putting off all strife and contentions. Now, we are to give no room to strife and put an end to it. That's what the call is for us when we look at this today in the mirror. Shaul says to Titos, this is where I was saying earlier, as it flows on, in Titos 3 verse 9, it says, keep away from foolish questions and genealogies and strife and quarrels about the Torah, for they are unprofitable and useless. We would do well to heed this instruction. Stay away from strife and quarrels about matters of the Torah, because the enemy just wants to pick a fight. Try and trip you up. It's what the enemy's been doing since the garden. You know? Surely it doesn't mean that. And they, it, it comes in in a small way. And eventually it's this huge battle. No, but it does. No, but it doesn't. What did Yahushua do to the devil when he was tempted three times? He quoted from Devarim and, he, and made it clear. I'm not entertaining an argument with you. I'm not going to get into quarrels and, 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 and enter into strife over that. He's always seeking an opportunity, the enemy that is, to get into a heated debate and argument over matters of the Torah. And while we certainly proclaim the truth and defend it by guarding it and doing it, that's how we stand armed in the Torah. And after having done all stand, we lift up the shield of belief. We take up the sword of the Spirit. And in order to take up a sword, you've got to be skilled in the sword. And to get skilled in the sword, you must meditate on the word. Because the sword is the word. That's what we are to stand firm on, on the rock of our deliverance. We have to be careful not to fall into useless arguments that just cause strife, and which many who refuse to hear the truth want to do. They just want to, because they don't really want to hear what you have to say, they want to try and just have an argument. Because if they can try and win the argument, they feel they've done themselves a good victory in justifying why they don't have to obey what the word is calling for. And the Hebrew word, for strife, 
or strive with the uh, Midianites or take vengeance and do, you know. Um, the Hebrew word for strife is riv, which means to contend. It even means to complain or argue or dispute or quarrel. And the Greek word that's used uh, uh, for strife is machomai. It means to fight, argue, or quarrel. And why I'm mentioning that is because Shaul tells Timotheus similar words to Titos. And then he also says um, where strife comes from. It comes from verbal battles. And in speaking of one who teaches falsely, he was reminding Timotheus about, so about the false teachers. He says he is puffed up. This is a false teacher, and it's in 1 Timothy 6 verse 4. Understanding none at all, but is sick about questionings and verbal battles from which come envy, strife, slander, and wicked suspicions. The lesson is very clear. Stay away from verbal battles. Because you're only just going to drain yourself. You're going to end up getting hurt in the process and whatever, you know. And so when we see this, vengeance belongs to Yahweh. That's the other thing that we must learn. And what we see here is our ability to be slow to, slow to speak, quick to listen, and slow to become angry. Now, we're not robots, so you can't just flick a switch and we'll never be angry anymore. Anger isn't a sin in itself, but if anger isn't dealt with, it can lead to sin, you know? And so therefore, we have to be slow to become angry because that will allow us the ability to squash out any possible strife that's trying to just surface in any way, you know? We must give room to Yahweh and his vengeance and let it run the course. You know, often we want to fix the matter and get it dealt with quickly and think we can do it. Some, we just got to leave it to Yahweh. Let it be in Yahweh's hands. The work of the Torah is to gather us in a legitimate way and put an end to strife so that we can take possession of our coming inheritance. That was what they were doing here. Distress them so that they're not going to stop you from entering in. Because if they didn't do this, they were on the verge of not entering in, just like their fathers didn't, you know? Moshe commands the people to arm themselves for the campaign, and he takes a thousand from each tribe. And in the context here, it's not a big army. A 12,000 armed men, 1,000 from each tribe, going against five kings and their armies. Okay, so I want you to see that the odds were not in Israel's favor, I mean, physically speaking. Look at the booty. Yes. You know, in each tribe, uh, taking a thousand from each tribe highlights every tribe had equal responsibility. And this is why in the body, we all, we might all be different parts, but we have equal responsibility to guarding set of partners. We don't say, oh, that's for them to do. I don't need to do it because that, we all are required to uphold the standard of set of partners. And guarding safety in the body and refuting all forms of strife is the duty of every part of the body, no matter how big or small you are. Pinchas was sent with the 12,000. We know that Pinchas is a clear shadow picture of Messiah. He put to death the whoring in the camp. We looked at that last week or the week before. And it pictures us being an agent of deliverance, you know. And Pinchas had trumpets for sounding in his hand. And this is another picture of Messiah. Shaul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8, For indeed, if the trumpet makes an indistinct sound, who shall prepare himself for battle? The answer is nobody. Because if it makes a sound you don't recognize, what are you going to do? You're not going to do anything. And we know whenever a trumpet was sounded once, the leaders, when it was twice in the camps, there was a whole, there was a distinct sound that would happen. But when you just hear some random sound, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to jump up and be ready for war. But we who are in the Torah, blessed are those who know the sounding. They walk, O Yahweh, in the light of your face. We are told in Devarim 20 verse 4, Yahweh your Elohim is, is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. And in Nehemiah 4 verse 20, it says, whatever place you hear the sound of the ram's horn, join us there, our Elohim fights for us. This is when they were rebuilding the walls and, you know, and distributing as the guys were had their sword in the one hand and they were trough or whatever uh, in the other hand, tr trowel in the other hand, trough, trowel in the other hand and they were doing the cement work, you know. Skilled left and right, you've got to think, you know, very skilled. 
if you're right-handed and you're trying to work with a a, a, a trowel, <laughs> I don't know why I keep wanting to say trough, a trowel, you know, it might be a messy affair. <laughs> you know, so so it's a it's a truffle. There we go. See, I'm almost Afrikaans. There we go. Truffle. Okay. So just in that picture alone, in the days of Nehemiah, it highlights for us, like some of the tribe of Binyamin, they were skilled in both the right and the left hand. This means that when we cling to Yahweh, now I'm not making a physical thing as saying you should be able to write with both your left hand. From a spiritual perspective, it means we are putting all our effort and work into clinging to Yahweh and not letting go, you know. Pinchas represents for us the physical and visible sign of the presence of Yahweh who leads and fights for his nation. And we also take note of here is that 12,000 men went out to fight against five kings and their armies and not one of the 12,000 was lost. This is a miracle victory. They obeyed the instructions that was given by Yahweh through Moshe and not one was hurt. This is a lesson in itself for us too. When we obey Yahweh's word, he fights for us and we will suffer no harm. You know, During the battle, Israel succeeded in killing every man, including Bilam, I might add. Mm. So here, the false prophet was also put to death as a shadow picture of the judgment that's coming on the false teachers and those that are leading people away from the Torah, trying to lure people away from the truth. And the woman who followed Bilam's advice and caused the moral decay of the camp, Israel didn't put to death, and Moshe was very furious about this, you know. And when he saw it, that Yahweh's vengeance was not upheld, he was very angry because they were given a strict instruction. It's the same thing that King Shaul was told to do when he was told to kill Agag and his entire nation, and he kept Agag alive and took all the best of the sheep, which should have been under the ban. And Shemuel says, what's this bleating of sheep that I hear? You know, it's better to obey. Oh, no, but I'm doing it. I've got them to slaughter to Yahweh. Obedience is better than sacrifice. When you obey, you'll do the right sacrifice. But when people are putting on a show, curbing their, necess their ne necessity to obey, Yahweh sees that. You know, and so Moshe was very angry here, you know, and he ordered, kill all the women that have known a man and all the male children. Keep alive the maiden daughters that have not known a man, that haven't been defiled in any way so that their defilement would not enter the camp. And five kings, and we learn a great deal here when we look at these kings, along with Bilam. Uh, I, also, I also strongly suspect that Bilam's donkey was part of the spoil, you know, the donkey that spoke to him. <laughs> um, and when we look at the names of these kings, we can learn valuable lessons of what we are to put to death in our daily living as set-apart people with our master, you know. The five kings represent for us the rule a striving people have over their lives and the things that we are not to allow to rule over our lives. Ivi means my lust or my desire. That's self-explanatory. Put to death the lusts of the youth. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life is not of Elohim, you know. So don't be running after the things of the flesh, the lustful desires. Rekem means having many colors, coming from the verb rakam, which means to variegate or embroider or skillfully wrought. Now to variegate or variegate, means to diversify in external appearance. So this is another valuable lesson. This can speak about putting on a variety of masks and not being true to who you are in the master, but putting on a show or display. In other words, putting on hypocrisy. Joel reminds us in Romans, let, um, let love be without hypocrisy. Love for Elohim is to obey his commands. Don't put on a show before people and that's just for a Shabbat or for a feast. You know, yes, I obey, oh yes, oh, and say all the right words and oh, and put on a show. Go out in the week and you're not keep upholding the Torah. You know, put on a different hat, so to speak, a different mask. 
We learn from the lesson of Shaul when he went out persecuting the true believers on his way to Damascus that Yahweh blinded him and then opened his eyes again. In other words, he went to a place, we often say, where he demasks us, you know, Damascus or Damasek. But it's just a nice picture that we get because in our dying to self and our acceptance of our master as our head, we are saying we're putting off all hypocrisy. And we're not going to variegate our lives before others. You know, so that's when Shaul says, I became all things to all people, he wasn't changing who he was. He spoke in a manner that would be able to be understood according to their culture or their language, speaking at their understandable level, not disregarding the Torah, not saying, okay, you don't do this, I'll join with you. That's not what he's saying when he became all things to all people. What he meant was, I came in a means to communicate with you that you can understand. Different class, different culture, different language. And it highlights a valuable lesson that Yahweh in doing so is restoring a clean lip, breaking the confusion that he brought at the curse of Babel, where the languages split the people apart. So Shaul is basically saying, I can come and I can relate to you. I can explain to you that you have a way to understand who the true Yahweh is, you know. So putting on various masks and not being true to who you are is something that we should not be doing. We are to distress that notion in our lives, put vengeance to it so that it has no part in our lives. Tzur, we looked at last week, means rock. And uh, we know that the, the daughter Cosby, uh, well, one of the sovereigns, this Tzur, her daughter, his daughter was Cosby, that, that's the one that came in the camp and was joined to a man of Shimon that Pinchas put to death. Cosby means my lie. And so we understand this represents the false rock. Now, you're either on the rock or you're on sand, but the enemy tries to present a false rock by presenting lies as truth. And we are to be on guard against the lies of the, the Torah has done away with, and we don't need it, okay? Chur means whole, coming from the verb chavar, which means to be or grow pale or turn pale, which is a picture of, the. you know, when somebody's growing pale, it's the idea of they're going sick. And, and as I explain a little bit more about this, you'll understand what it is, is that, you know, when people aren't guarding the truth, Israel, were, or Ephraim was re rebuked as growing pale. Why? Because they were hanging down, their knees were weak, they were growing pale, they were clutching their, 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 their loins, their knees, like a woman in labor, like oh, everything's bad, because they weren't standing upright. Mm -hmm. So we, we are to be on guard against becoming sick by the maddening adulteries of the whore. Reva means four or fourth part coming from the verb rava, which means to lie stretched out or to lie down or breed together or mate. Now, when we recognize that Rome is the fourth horn or the fourth, be or the, the, the fourth beast that scatters the children of Israel, we're also able to see that we are not to lie down with her. You know, rava as a verb is only used three times in Scripture, and twice it's used in the instruction for a woman not to lie down with a beast, and the other is to not to uh, let livestock mate with another kind. So here we get this picture of don't mix. Don't whore and be mixed and join yourself to false worship. You know, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. This is a picture of whoring that's abominable and is strictly forbidden. And as we consider these five kings, we can certainly begin to understand the very things that we must kill in order to keep strife out of our lives. Kepha 2, or, uh, or Kepha Aleph, chapter 2, verse 11, says, Beloved ones, I appeal to your sojourners and pilgrims to abstain from fleshly lusts which battle against the life. You know, we still have this earthen vessels that will be trans formed when our master comes for us. But for now, we have this battle. 
And he engages in this, you know, I want to do what I, 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 I do what I don't, don't want to do. And I seem to be doing what I don't want to do. He wasn't saying he was falling prey. He was highlighting to the believers in Rome, this is this intense battle that often goes on. But he says, you know what? You can overcome it in Messiah because he gives you the comp competency to do so. And without Messiah, you're going to have this battle in the flesh and spirit, and the flesh is always going to win. But to put to death the flesh, you've got to stay in Messiah. Staying in Messiah is staying in his word, is staying in his truth, his Torah that lights our path, that gives us the boundaries to protect us from being infected against breaches that cause strife. We are to destroy all forms of hypocrisy. It's Romans 12, verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Shrink from, wick, uh, shrink from what is wicked, cling to what is good. Now, I gave you this picture of clinging. In Hebrew, that's the word davak, and it means to cling or to hold on to. In Greek, it's koleo, which comes from the uh, word which we get the word in Greek for glue. So when you cling to something, it has the idea, even in the Greek mindset, that it's, you're so fastened to it, you won't let go. Ephraim, or the, uh, Israel, the house of Israel, are rebuked in the prophets for clinging to the good and doing it well. Now, if our hands represent the picture of what we do, our works, then that which you cling to represents that which, what you do and the standard by which you live. And if you're clinging to the evil to do it well, there are a lot of skilled evil ones in this world today. We are to be skilled in set of partners by clinging to Yahweh. You know, we also have to not fall for the false rock. Devarim 32 verse 31, it says, for their rock is not like our rock. Even our enemies are judges. And we also ask this question of what does it mean to be growing pale when I uh, told you about uh, Israel? In Yirmiyahu 30 verse 6, it says, ask now and see if a man is giving birth. I mean, that's like a weird thing. Is a man giving birth now? Although the world's trying to do that, but I mean... From a, it's like that's not a possible thing. Why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? All faces are turned pale. That's the image that we get here, you know. He, what Yirmiyahu was told to go speak, are we going to look at Yirmiyahu's introduction to going and speaking the word, which he spoke for 40 years, by, by the way, from a teenager for a 40-year period for the last five kings of Israel, he had to stand up and speak out, thrown into a dungeon, thrown into dry wells, chained, not listened to. And here comes this rebuke saying to the nation, why have you got your hands on your knees as if you're in labor? Do men go into labor? So what the heck are you doing? You're not standing up and fighting the good fight of the belief. And we would do well to not lie down with the whore of Babylon. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, flee whoring. For every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits whoring sins against his own body. Now, we collectively are the body of Messiah. And when you join yourself to that which is false and whore away from obedience to the truth, maybe you break the Sabbath, you, you join yourself into false worship, just know that you're sinning against the entire body. You're bringing a breach into the body, you know. And one of the lessons that we can learn in keeping strife extremely far away from us is that we see here that Bilam was put to death. And Bilam, as we remember, means not of the people. And in a nutshell, we must kill and have nothing to do with all that is not of the people of Israel. And what I mean by that, it means Shaul isn't saying, and Yahweh's not saying, you must go out of the world. But we don't join ourselves in association with that which breaks Yahweh's witness and character before people. We must give no room to false prophets and the leading that they have in, in, a, in charging people to be nullifying the Torah or saying you don't need the Torah with ear-tickling messages. We are not to entertain that. In fact, that's a denial of Messiah. And 1 John, we are clearly told that anyone who does not 
believe or claim that Yahushua has come in the flesh, that is Yahweh, is our Savior. Don't even let that one in your house. And how do you let people in your house today? Through your tablets, your iPhones, your Androids, your TVs, podcasts, what you're listening to. So when we're giving ear to things of that which does not represent Yahweh, as that which should shape our life and our mind and our thinking is being given over to whoring. And that will bring strife into our life. When, as we spoke a couple of weeks ago, we are to be what Israel were before whoring got in the camp, an unsuspecting people among the nations, not worried about what they're doing and trying to curse you. When you've got Yahweh protecting you, you don't need to worry about what, you know what they're doing now. No, I don't, and I don't care. What I care about is clinging to Yahweh. You know, it's when you open that subtle door, it's like Cosby and what was the, the uh, uh, what was his name again? Zimri, my music, my music and my lie. Cosby, my lie, Zimri, my music. Well, they brought in the camp and, and they shouldn't even have been near the tabernacle because the Levites are supposed to camp between the tabernacle and the, the, the things. They just come in there and, you know, flaunted their whoring. When we allow just that little bit, oh, no, but I just want to hear what they have to say. Be on guard against that because that can just be that little opening. You know, it's like when there's a little leak. Scripture talks about, you know, fixing it before it bursts out, you know, because it also talks about the quarrels. You know, it's like a little leak, and if you don't sort it out and, and, you, and you don't stop it, it bursts. So when we entertain that little bit of evil, you might just bring a crack in the wall that eventually just bursts through and can destroy a wall. And when it gets a wall destroyed, it can destroy those that the wall and boundaries were to protect. You know, so Shoal reminds Timotheus in, in 1 Timothy 6 that if anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, those of our master, Yehoshua Messiah, and to the teaching which is according to reverence, he doesn't bring that. In reverence and awe of who Yahweh is, he is puffed up, understanding none at all, but sick about questionings and verbal battles which come from strife, slander, wicked suspicions, and worthless disputes of men of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth, who think that reverence is a means of gain. Then he says, withdraw from such. Don't go try and win a battle with them. Move away from them. Then the clear witness here, as they came back from the campaign, great victory. It was told, okay, you've, you've killed her, this blood's been shed, you know. The requirements of all that had killed or touched a dead body was to cleanse themselves on the third day and on the seventh day. And here once again, as in the cleansing of a leper and a, and a cleansing of um, the Nazarite, we, what we see is right through Scripture, we see this third day, seventh day idea or cleansing picture. And it's very parabolic for us today in many ways for understanding what we have in the Master because we see this third day principle highlighting his third day resurrection. In Hosea 6 verse 2, it says, After two days he shall revive us, and on the third day he shall raise us up so that we live before him. Because it was on the third day that he raised from the dead after three days and three nights in the heart of the earth as the sign of Yona would be the only sign given to the wicked generation a wicked and adulterous generation. So the third day picture is one of a resurrection power in us that gives us life in Messiah. And Kepha reminds us to not let one matter be hidden from us, and that is with Yahweh one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Then we can go all the way back to creation week and we see that the seven days of creation highlights the millennia plan for Yahweh, the seven millennia that he has. And on the fourth day, when he gave the ruling of the sun and the moon and made the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night, there was light in the beginning. There was evening and morning right from day one. But he gave the functions of what the sun and the moon would do in ruling the day and the night. It would be there for days, years, months, seasons, and appointed times. And in the fourth millennium, Yahushua, who is the Aleph and the Tub, who is the beginning and the end, who is the light of the world, came in the form of man to call us out of darkness into his marvelous light in order for us now to understand his appointments, to understand how we are to separate the light from the darkness in our lives. 
and not to be engaged in the dark things of this world, but walk as children of light. And from that fourth day, we again see three days until the seventh day when he's coming again. So on the fourth day, the fourth millennium, he brought a, he brought a cleansing by his third day resurrection of reviving us to be able to draw near to him. Israel, when they were at Mount Sinai, they were told by Yahweh through Moshe, they got two days to get ready. And on the third day, he was coming down when he came down with fire. And when he came down with the sound of a trumpet and entered into a marriage covenant with them. And so too do we see that from the fourth day, the fourth millennium, when our master came to separate light from darkness, he's given his bride two days to get ready. And on the third day, the seventh millennium, he's coming to fetch his bride and complete his work. Because it was on the seventh day of the week that Yahweh completed his work and rested. And so we see on the seventh day, Yahweh will still have some work to be done. That's why we also see that the work that is referred to as not being done on the Sabbath is your normal occupational work because there was still work done on the Sabbath. The slaughterings were done. And if a Sabbath fell on a new moon, there was more slaughterings. Ricardo was going through all the calculations of how much flour and oil was used on a Sabbath or a new moon, etc. last week with all the slaughterings that we went through. You know, So we understand that our master still has a work to be completed before we enter into the renewal and be with him forever. And so we see a powerful witness of this cleansing that's given here. Um, if one wasn't cleansed on the third day, you cannot be cleansed on the seventh day. So when our master comes in the seventh millennium, those that have not called on Yahweh and been saved, gone through the waters and have been cleansed from wickedness, cannot come and claim that cleansing on the seventh day. If you have not received an immersion in his name now, by that third day cleansing that's available to all who will call upon his name, then you can't wait till he comes on the seventh millennium. You know, some people think, oh, we can do what we want now. We don't need to obey. We'll just enter into the reign of the heavens when he comes. If you haven't had his third day cleansing, that washing, which there was the requirement of every man to do, wash yourselves. So it takes our bold confession to die to self and accept his resurrection power as the only life that we will allow to lead us in everything that we do because we are now not our own. But if you haven't been bought at a price, you can't be bought on the seventh day. Does that make sense? You know. Draw near to Elohim. The Hebrew word for cleanse, just by the way, is chata. Now chata is typically understood as sin or miss the mark or incur guilt or fail to reach. And when we understand the root meaning of Torah, which means to aim in the right direction and move in that direction, coming from the root word yara, which means to throw, you get the idea of a target. And when you aim at a target and you throw at the target, you hopefully hit bullseye. That's what Torah understands. When you're so off the mark and you don't even get on the board, that's missing the mark. That's sin. That's lawlessness. Okay. And 1 John 3 verse 4 says, everyone doing sin also does lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. We're also told in the renewed writings that all unrighteousness is sin. So in your mind's eye picture, Sin equals lawlessness equals unrighteousness. Therefore, righteousness equals obedience to the law, equals belief. Because in Hebrews, the, the, we're told that they didn't enter into the promised land because they did not obey. And then we're told they did not enter in because of unbelief. So belief equals obedience. That's why Yaakov says, show me what you believe by what, show me what you believe. By what you do. But I'll show you. I don't understand. He was taunting them. He says, I'll show you what I believe by what I do. Please show me how your belief works. Because a lot of people say, I believe, I believe. Well, what? let me see what you believe. What do you do? You're joining yourself to corrupt ways? No, I know what you believe. You know? So belief in the master equals obedience equals righteousness equals a law-abiding citizen of the reign of the heavens. Now, to be done with sin, so to cleanse oneself, which is used from the root word chata, which means to cleanse yourself from missing the mark. And the way that we're done with sin in the master, because um, everyone staying in him, 1 John 3 verse 6 says, does not sin. Everyone sinning has neither seen him nor known him. So when people are not obeying the Torah, 
They don't know him. We spoke about knowing Yahweh as experiencing him a while back because we have this relationship. And when people claim to know him but don't do what his word says, he will say, I don't know you. You haven't walked with me, you know. And the way to be done with sin and to cleanse ourselves is to stay in the master because when we stay in the master, he stays in us. Yaakov says, draw near to Elohim and he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands, you sinners, and cleanse the hearts, you double-minded. Cleansing hands is an idiom for cleaning up our ways, our works. And cleansing our hearts is an expression that tells us to get deceit out and ensure that through the meditation of the Torah, we guard that which his spirit writes upon our hearts and his renewed covenant that we are to meditate on and that which continually causes us to keep clean as a husband that's washing his bride through the word. So that when the seventh day comes, the third day cleansing has remained intact because we've guarded our garments. And everything had to be purified. That which had to be put through fire, all the gold, the silver, the tin, the brass, the bronze, everything that could go through fire had to pass through fire. And that which couldn't go through fire, like the goats here, I mean, you can understand, it's not going to go through the fire, you know, had to be go through the water. And it's quite interesting because the reference here to goats here, some people, why are you mentioning goats here and the wood in it? Those, part, those articles that were mentioned were all used in coverings for the tabernacle. So this is a wonderful picture again because our master is our head. He's our covering. And what this putting to death the strife, distressing the strife out of your life, taking vengeance on it so it has no part in your life, also highlights having no false coverings over your life anymore. You know, mm -hmm. cleansing our life from false coverings to that which is in Messiah. And the four coverings on the tabernacle, set apart place and most set apart place, highlight who we are in the master and his protection over us, you know. And then everything had to be divided into two parts. The men who went out into the campaign, they got half, but they would give one out of every 500 to Eleazar. And then the rest that went to the people who didn't, the men who didn't go on the campaign, they would give one out of every 500, out of every 50 to, Ele, to the Levites. So there's a, there's a clear picture. Those who went to battle actually ended up giving less than those who didn't go out to battle. So those who didn't go out to battle, it actually what they got from the spoil, I mean, they got it for nothing, they didn't go out, but they had to give more, one out, one out of every 50 as opposed to one out of every 500. You know, and so um, we see here there's responsibility again of what comes back from the battle, and one of the things in Scripture that we see regularly highlighting, Yahweh is the one that, made it clear, only send 12,000 out or only send that out. See, you know, in times in Scripture when men weren't called to battle, some of them got upset because they didn't go out. And it was quite clear that when even when David went and some of his men were a bit tired or when Gidon's army was whittled down, we see the clear picture that the spoils of war is not only for those that go out to war. They get a greater reward, but it's for everybody to share in the spoil of war, you know. And so just looking at the numbers is quite interesting. You've got 12,000 guys with Pinchas going out. And they come back with 675,000 sheep. 72,000 cattle, 61,000 donkeys, and 32,000 women who had not known a man. So they had to go out and gain and kill the ones that they had initially brought back. But just picture the scene. Those who like, Ricardo, you like doing maths. <laughs> How, how many animals is that per person? You know, so 675,000, 72,000, that's over 740,000, 800,000 plus animals being brought back by 12,000. Can you imagine the noise? <laughs> you know, I sometimes like to stop and just think, you know, these 12,000 went up. They'd just seen what Pinchas did in the camp, and Yahweh was... And they put the leaders to death in the camp because they led wrong. Yeah. Now 12,000 go out. Oh, I mean, these guys must think, okay, here we're going against five kings. But they were led with Pinchas, who was ardent for Yahweh. You see, when we go out and we're in fear, then we're not in the master. When we stand and are strong and courageous, that's not an arrogant stand. That's knowing who fights for you, who your leader is, who your chief is. 
And then when we walk in the victorious procession of our master, we too can have this victorious shout of praise in realizing that when our master brings the victory, it's a celebration. You know, now you think of all this, the portion that was given to Elazar, he got 675 sheep, 72 don uh, cattle, 61 donkeys, and he got 32 people of the woman that had not known a man. That was allocated to Elazar and his family, you know. Um, and then the portion that was to the Levites, and the Levites obviously did the service in the tabernacle and prepared, etc. 6,750 sheep, 720 cattle, 610 donkeys, and also 320 people, um, not 32 people. And after everything had been divided up, so when what was brought back by the men of battle and given distributed among all, I mean, you just take out of 800,000, you just take out 7,000 odd. So there's still over 700,000 that was distributed amongst the nation. And when the men came and they were just, I mean, you can imagine, they're distributing it to everybody. Everybody's getting all this uh, um, reward. And then they come and they go, hold on, but not one of us is missing. They were so excited that they, because they not only brought animals, because that's what was required to bring back. But this was a test for their hearts too. Because they'd got a lot of gold and silver, because the, the thing was, whatever gold, tin, and everything else, you know, they had to pass through the fire. So they obviously did bring back, but that wasn't split up between Eleazar and the Levites. Or no levy of that was given to them. So what we understand is that they obviously picked up a lot of jewelry as part of their spoil. And they picked up so much that it was 16,750 shekels of gold that these 12,000 men had also gathered. And when they saw, hold on, we're all still here. We've taken account and not one of us has died. This is a miracle. We defeated five kings and their armies. We want to give thanks to Yahweh because they recognize that it's Yahweh who brought the battle, you know. And then they bring this to you. And if you work it out, I mean, in rand value, in today's gold price, it's well over 200 million rands worth that they brought as an offering. So they didn't bring all the gold that they took, just what they wanted to say thanks with. Probably around 12 or $13 million. You know, no small change from 12,000 people saying, hey. And they still had left over. This was their contribution to say thanks to Yahweh. They recognized that this battle that they were called to go out to face was Yahweh's, and the victory was Yahweh's. And these men gave a thanks offering to Yahweh, declaring their gratitude and thanks to Elohim who fought for them. And while we might not have millions to give, Yehoshua made it clear to his taught ones, when the woman gave the two mites, she gave more than the rich man. Mm because they give out of their excess. She gave out of her lack, what she had, you know. What we do recognize is that our whole lives, if we've been bought at a price, our gifts, our talents, our time, our resources, our intellect must be given over to him as a free will offering of thanksgiving for the victory over sin and death that he's given to your life. Anybody want to share their thoughts on this? Because this is a clear chapter that highlights, don't let strife be in. Yaakov says, where does strife and contentions come from? It comes from you wanting what you don't have, you know? And when you ask for it, you don't receive it because you're asking in a wrong way. Because actually you're just trying to feed. What things in you are you really wanting to have, which is not Yahweh's plan for you, because if it was, you'd have it. And we have to keep learning those lessons. There's one thing, present your request with thanksgiving to Yahweh, but let his will be done, you know? Because when we allow things of the flesh to consume us, we, we let our grip that's supposed to be glued or cl clung to Yahweh be loosened, you know? Any thoughts on this chapter? Before we go to chapter 32, Kayla's getting ready to read. Um, one of the things I think 
about going to the plane into his the camp of Israel because he was judging those who were yes. in the camp. Yes. And then he said to the camp, go and annihilate the nation. Yeah. So it, again, it's a, the covenant process of he will discipline those in the camp because he can see the heart. Yes. He knew which 24,000 he had to kill. Yes. Yes. Right? But then your participation is annihilating that thing that made you. Now you have a responsibility. Because you, if you were left over, you obviously didn't walk yes. with them. Yeah. But they still had the potential to infiltrate. Yeah. So you can take that away. Yeah. That's why he said kill everything. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we learn in our walk over the years. When we see Yahweh's discipline that might end up causing people to be destroyed because they're not trained by his discipline. But we who are trained through, not necessarily even on our own discipline, but what we see on the discipline of others, and it trains us to bring about the peaceable fruit of righteousness, we have a responsibility to make sure that that which caused the discipline of others or even ourselves should not happen again. You know? By not giving room for it. Because that's, that's the idea of um, taking vengeance. Don't give it room. Don't give it, don't give it an inch. Don't give it a millimeter, you know? Keep seeing in history how he said when you go in, you destroy those seven nations. Yes. And they did it. No. Because if you leave it up to man, he will find that his reason for not doing what, yeah. what he was commanded yeah. to do. And that ended up being a snare to this day. Yeah. <laughs> but if he, but when Yahweh judges in the camp, he sees the heart and he you know, gets yeah. rid of that. But and Yahweh now, adds and takes away. Yeah. Because on the same breath, under this whole thing, Yahweh added 32,000 women that had not known a man to the, to the body. Mm. See, Yahweh adds and takes away. So this is the thing that we also take note of. Be ready to read. Okay, chapter 32. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had much livestock, a large number. And they saw the land of Yazed and the land of Gilad and saw that the place was a place for livestock. So the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spoke to Moshe and to Eleazar the priest and to the, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, Ataroth and Divon and Yazed and Nimrah and Heshbon and Alale and Sevam and Nevo and Bion, the land which Yahweh had stricken before the congregation of Israel, is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. And they said, If we have found favor in your eyes, let this land be given to your servants as a possession, and do not let us pass over to the let a, do not let us pass over the Arden. And Moshe said to the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Are your brothers to go into the battle while you yourselves sit here? Now why do you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from passing over into the land which Yahweh has given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For, with, for, where they, for when they went up to the Wadi Eshkol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel, so that they did not go into the land which Yahweh had given them. Then the displeasure of Yahweh burned on that day, and he swore an oath, saying, Not one of the men who came up from Mitzrayim from twenty years old and above is to see the land of which I swore to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, because they did not follow me completely except Caleb, son of Yephuna, the Kenazite, and Yahushua, son of Nun, who there followed Yahweh completely. So the displeasure of Yahweh burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the wilderness forty years, until all the generation that had done evil in the eyes of Yahweh was destroyed. And see, you have risen in your father's place an increase of men, sinners, to add still more the, to add still more the burning displeasure of Yahweh against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he shall once again leave them in the wilderness, and you shall destroy all these people. Then they came near to him and said, Let us build sheep enclosures here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. But let us ourselves be armed, hastening before the children of Israel, until we have brought them to their place. And our little ones shall dwell in the walled cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We shall not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. For we shall not inherit with them on the other side of the Jordan and beyond, because our inheritance has fallen to us on this eastern side of the Jordan. And Moshe said to them, If you make this promise, if you arm yourselves before Yahweh for battle, 
and all your armed ones pass over the yard and before Yahweh until he has driven out his enemies from before him, and the land has been subdued before Yahweh. Then afterward you shall return and be guiltless before Yahweh and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before Yahweh. But if you do not do so, then see, you shall sin against Yahweh, and know, your sin is going to find you out. Build cities for your little ones and enclosures for your sheep, and do what you have promised. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben spoke to Moshe, saying, Your servants are going to do as my master commands. Our little ones, our wives, our flocks, and all our livestock are going to be there in the cities of Gilad. But your servants are passing over, every armed one of the army before Yahweh, to battle, as my master says. And Moshe gave command concerning them to Eleazar the priest, to Yehoshua son of Nun, and to the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. And Moshe said to them, If the children of Gad and the children of Reuben pass over the yard and with you, every man armed with battle before Yahweh, and the land has been subdued before you, then you shall give them the land of Gilad as a possession. But if they do not pass over armed with you, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. Then the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As Yahweh has said to your servants, so we do. We ourselves are passing over armed before Yahweh into the land of Canaan, but the possession of our inheritance remains with us beyond the Jordan. So Moshe gave to the children of God, to the children of Reuben, and to half the tribe of Manasseh, son of Yosef, the reign of Sichon, sovereign of the Amorites, and the reign of Og, sovereign of Bashan, the land with its cities within the borders, the cities of the land round, the cities of the land round about. And the children of God, Baldivon, and Ataroth, and Arerar, and Atroth, Shofan, and Yazer, and Yogbaha, and Beit Namra, and Beit Haran, walled cities and enclosures for sheep. And the children of Reuben built Heshbon, and Alale, and Kiriathim, Nevo, and Baalmeon, the names being changed, and Shivma. And they gave other names to the cities which they built. And the sons of Machir, son of Manasseh, went to Gilad and took it, and dispossessed the Amorites who were in it. So Moshe gave Gilad to Machir, son of Manasseh, and he dwelt in it. And Yair, son of Manasseh, went and took its small towns, and called them Chavot Yair. And Novach went and took Kenath and its villages, and he called it Novach, after his own name. Okay, so after the allocation of the spoils, the children of Reuben and Gad saw that they had a lot of livestock, and they wanted to settle in the land um, of Yazer, uh, um, in the land of Gilad, which was a obviously a very good land for livestock. They said, this is good for us. Can we settle here? There's a, there's a great number of lessons that we can take from this chapter, both positive and negative, or warnings and encouragements, maybe the better way to put it. And we have to bear in mind that each tribe received a great number of livestock. So when you add the portion given to the thousand men from each tribe, we got to see that each tribe received well over 55,000 uh, sheep, almost 6,000 cattle, and over 5,000 donkeys. Every tribe got that. It may be that Reuben and Gad already had a fair amount of animals. So now this is added to them. It's like, whoa, this is quite a lot. You know, we're not told that they had much more than the other tribes. We're not told that either. They just went and said, listen, the, this land is good for us here. Can we stay here? Because we've got lots of livestock. So they acknowledged, geez, this is a big, big reward, you know. Um, and they possibly, what we recognize here is the desire to settle their livestock sooner rather than later. In other words, let's settle now. It's like we've got enough. Why should we wait to go across the river? You know, we've got it. We're already sorted now. Why do we need to carry on going? We can, we can live here. This is good for us to live, you know. And this is possibly with the hope of increasing their wealth. As they saw room for their livestock to grow much bigger, they saw, okay, if we can, we, we, we see this as okay. They hadn't even seen the promised land yet that they were thought this is promised enough, so to speak, you know. And did they want to stay out of the land for wealth? That's one aspect to see. We know the whole picture because we've got the whole chapter. And we go to Yehoshua and we see that they did fulfill their word. So we know the whole picture, but we've got to put ourselves with this mirror questioning our own lives and our motives because we've not yet arrived. But where are we at in our journey? Are we finding ourselves saying, okay, well, I've arrived now. This is good enough for me. I don't need to carry on sojourning. in the I'm, I can settle here, and I'm fine where I'm at. As long as I see my wealth growing, I'm okay, you know. And so 
when we look at this, in one essence, or one sense, we see a picture of two tribes who were looking at their wealth rather than at the promise because they were satisfied where they were at. A lot of people today don't see the need to obey the word because I was told by a guy many years ago, look at my life. Look how blessed I am. Why do I need to keep the Sabbath? I'm doing well. I, I, I read the word. Why do I need to? You, you, you don't, I don't need to do anything, he told me. You know, because some people are just think, well, I look, at, I look at my circumstances and then how can you say I'm not blessed? So it shows where their focus is. They're looking on the material side of things, the fleshly side of things that, will, that, that does not store up any treasure in the heavens at all, you know. And in a sense, it was as if they had thought to themselves, we have arrived and this is what lots of people do today based on their possessions. They don't think they need to do anything else in the word. Why? I'm talking scripture and physical aspects together, how people justify why they don't have to do the Torah. Because look at my life. I'm healthy. I'm well. I've got lots of stuff, you know. These guys hadn't seen the promised land yet. And so this land was east of the Yarden. They might be able to see a bit over the yard and depending on where they were camped and located. But we also got to understand before they came to Moshe, they would have had a lot of deep discussions about, you know, look, this is actually going to be better for us. Do we really want to struggle? I mean, it's been a long haul. You know, let's like, hang out here now. This is good enough. We're just across the river. It's not that far. You know. And so they took matters in their own hands, so to speak, and then they come to Moshe, and, and, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, how many times have you found in your own life you've done the same thing, making decision for yourself before seeking Yahweh's approval thereof, before spending time in the Word, because you need to make a decision now, you need to go ahead and you just do it, only later to find out, you know, if I just actually thought about it a little bit more, if I only sought the Word on it a bit more, if I sought counsel in the Word and the wisdom of those in the Word, sought Yahweh, I might have made a better decision, you know. They were in danger of in infecting the other tribes into wanting to also settle there and eventually causing everyone to say, well, if they're not going, why should we go? Let's all settle here. And Moshe said, you're going to do what your fathers did. They're all dead now because of this evil that you're speaking here. And what's a clear picture being given to us here is to learn that on the one hand, it seems as though these tribes were willing to trade in their rightful share of the kingdom for their security right now. And that's a danger that so many people are in today. They feel that they're so secure. Why are you telling me to change? We have to stop and ask ourselves if our possessions or even the desire and lust of possessions, is it keeping us from the fullness of the presence of Yahweh? In other words, What's consuming your life, your thoughts? Is Yahweh an afterthought or a once a week if you get to it kind of thing? That everything else is about chasing the wealth to make sure that you're secure here and now and Yahweh is just the afterthought or if something goes right, oh, thanks, Yahweh. If it's not going right, you're not even seeking Yahweh, you're seeking yourself. That's one picture that we see here. Yehoshua said to his taught ones, I say to you, it's hard for a rich man to enter into the reign of the heavens. And he repeated it for emphasis. He wasn't saying it's not possible because the taught ones said, but we've left everything for you. How, what's, what's possible then? Who's possible? And he said, with Yahweh, all things are possible, but with man, it's not. You see, when you're focused on that which you have and not focused on Yahweh, you're not seeking the reign of the heavens. Then he uses an image. Now people have tried to, Talk about, the, you know, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, you know, than for a rich man to enter into the rain. And people have thought many times, oh, the one gate was called a needle and they get very... The point of the matter is, take a camel and try and put it through the eye of a needle. That's what you need to get as a picture. Because he spoke in parables. And nobody can get a camel through the eye of a needle. Okay, the one aspect is, oh, you have to take the baggage off and you have to let the camel go down. Nice thoughts, but the clear picture is you can't put a camel through the eye of a needle. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's the other, in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew context, the, the root word for camel, gamal, 
And the picture, the, the, the pictographic letter Gimel is a picture of a foot. Okay. R uh, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry. The, yes, it's a picture of a foot as well as a picture of a rope. So in the pictographic, there are one or two letters that have two pictures associated with it. So it's either a foot which represents your walk or a rope. Now the rope, regal means to walk, but the gimel letter is pictured like a foot, okay, or it's pictured as a rope in the ancient pictographic. So the other way to put it is there's a thought process that the camel being referred to here from the text can also represent rope. Now, when you are threading, when you're doing any, you know, I mean, look, if you guys have been in the army, you had to stitch your own things, okay? But if you haven't and you've tried to, even still, you know, you lick that thread a few times and it's like, whoa, and you, especially if your eyesight's not that great and you, you know, now try put a rope through that. So you get the picture. That's what it's like for a rich man who's so focused on his wealth to actually live in the reign of Elohim here and now because his focus isn't on Yahweh. You know, a lot of times when you go on journeys when you're small, maybe some go on more than others, maybe some only just see it in movies, but you see the concept of are we there yet? You know, it's because this frustration, oh, this is taking too long, are we there yet? And that's kind of like the picture, the one picture that we can get of some of the people of Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh. Listen, are we there yet? I mean, come on, I'm surely we can stop here, you know? And Moshe feared this, and you're all wrong. But then he gives them a conditional clause. He says, okay, because then they said, but can't we build sheep enclosures? And they out of themselves said, we will go and head the battle. We'll go in the front. We will fight for our brothers so they also get the possession. Then we'll come back. Mm. Moshe said, okay, now we're looking at today's Torah portion of about what we speak with our mouth and keeping our word. Mm. And Moshe said, okay. If you do what you say you're going to do and do what you've promised, then you can have this land. And here we see it, what we also take note of these two tribes and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Maybe some of you realize it or not, but in 1 Chronicles 5 verse 26, we're told, so the Elohim of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, sovereign of Ashur, even the spirit of tiglath Pileser, sovereign of Ashur, and he took the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh into exile and brought them to Chalach and Chavor and Hara and the river of Gozan unto this day. This was part of the exile that began to take place of the house of Israel. And Reuben, Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh were taken into exile eight years before the rest. Could it be because... That's where they settled and decided to be, that they got taken into captivity eight years before the rest. This generation was not like the last. They were committed to fight for their brothers. And this is a positive side. This, so we've looked at some of the negative aspects of what this can represent for us, but some of the positive is taking a stand. Not You, you don't think, okay, I've arrived. I, I understand the scripture. I don't need to know anymore. I don't need to do anything. You know, you guys carry on and you do your thing. I'm fine here. I'm sorted. No, we have to fight the good fight. We have to fight in a sense. When it's fight or wage the campaign, it's about the good news, living that life, being out there, fighting for your brother that hasn't received the inheritance yet. You know, we have to lead the fight against the enemies of the kingdom. Now that's not, as I said earlier, not going out with placards and taking up physical. When Yeshua told his taught ones, no, two swords is enough. I see that as a wonderful picture because when they were saying, oh, must we get, come, we're ready to fight. The Tanakh and the renewed writings, that's the two swords we need. From Bereshit to Chazam, that's what we need to wage the campaign, to always give a reason for the hope that we have. That's how we'll be able to withstand any battles that come against us when we lift up the shield of belief because our belief is what we do. So when we lift up our works, let your good works be seen by all men that they praise the Father in the day of his visitation. Praise Elohim in the day of his visitation. So these guys had to keep their word. And as Moshe made it clear when we looked at Devarim earlier, it says it remains sin in you until it's completed. Moshe said, if you don't keep your word, your sin is going to find you out. Mm. 
it might have been easier for them to say, no, we'll do it, we'll do it. That's what a lot of people say. Yes, we'll go and do it. And then finally when they saw it, can you picture the scene, they all built sheep enclosures and then they, because they said they'll go ahead. So it was a bit of a delay. They first built sheep enclosures and, and, and places for their animals and their wives. So that would have taken a little time. So there was a delay. And then they would go ahead. So as some of them might have thought, okay, as the, everybody's leaving, they might have thought, hold on. I know we said we'd go, but this looks, you know, it looks a bit too much. We, we, we kind of we shouldn't have to go now. And how many people do that? They commit to something. Yes, I'm going to do this. How many of you remember what you committed with your mouth a week ago? Never mind two years ago. Never mind 10 years ago. And I'm talking as a means of saying, being serious with somebody, yes, I'm going to do, where your yes was yes and your no was no. I hope there haven't been too many maybes that you've conveniently forgot to follow up on. In Yehoshua 22, verse 1 to 4, we see the record of Yehoshua called for the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh and said to them, you... You have guarded all that Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, commanded you and, you, and you have obeyed my voice in all that I commanded you. You have not left your brothers these many days up to this day, but have guarded the charge, the command of Yahweh your Elohim. And now Yahweh your Elohim has given rest to your brothers as he promised them. So now return and go to your tents and to the land of your possession, which Moshe, the servant of Yahweh, gave you beyond the Yarden. What we can take from this Torah portion that we're looking at today is the clear fact that our words are very important and we must do what we said we will do and what we've promised. And what we promise must line up with the word of Yahweh. Don't make promises that cause you to break the word because that's breaking the witness of Yahweh, you know. If anyone speaks, Kepha says, let him speak as let it be as the words of Elohim. If anyone serves, let it be with the strength of Elohim so that Elohim might be praised in it all through Yehoshua Messiah, to whom belong the esteem and the rule forever and ever. So that's the, the goal of our belief is the deliverance of lives. And we are to be speaking the truth, living the truth, shining the truth in everything that we do. And it's time for us to arm ourselves in the Torah and fight the good fight of the campaign, of the belief and not be settled in the comfort of our possessions that think give us an identity. So many people have their identity in their possessions. And Yahushua says, that's not a man's identity. You know, your life does not consist in what you have, your possessions. The richest thing we can be and are, are and are, and are, are, <laughs> is to be in Messiah. their eye off the bigger picture yes because they looked at their circumstances and didn't realize hey we're not going to be in the promised land we're going to be on the other side of the river yeah to go to Yahweh's dwelling place is going to be longer you were not a, i mean they ended up building a sort of place this side of the river just as a token yes. that they're still part of Israel because yeah. suddenly now they're not they cut off so sometimes yes i mean not sometimes you Ask Yahweh for something and he gives it to you. Like the verse says, he'll give you the desire of your heart, but he'll send leanness within your spirit. He's not going to force you to do anything against no. your will. If he sees you don't want to do it, he might say yes, but it might be the best thing. Yeah. Which is what happened here. They, didn't, yeah. they stopped and looked at the circumstances and didn't remember the bigger picture. Yeah. Ended up being far away, going into exile first, being cut off. From Had a lot of consequences. Yes. Yeah. Because he's not going to say, well, you better come with if you don't want yeah. to. I mean, he's, he doesn't force anyone to do no. anything against their will. No. He gives, that's why we have free will. That's why the world's in the state it's in. But I mean, he, he's, he's, in that sense, he's, he might say yes to your request, but it might not be what's best yeah. for you if you take your eyes off of the bigger picture. Yes. And the warning that was given here is that if they, were, if they were to turn away from following Yahweh, they would cause many to be destroyed in the wilderness, you know. And we have to learn to be careful not making short-lived promises that we can't actually keep. Even in that, now you say, yes, I'm going to fight until all my brothers in 
parents. Yeah. How many years did that? Yeah. That you were away from your house. Yes. Yeah. It's not oh next week we will tell you. Now that's why that's why Yahushua said after many days because Yahushua was old and about to die, so it was a a, a a number of years, you know, or probably almost a generation before they were able to go back. You know. So we, we, we learned some valuable lessons on the words we speak and how it can come back to bite you in years to come if you didn't do what you should have done, you know. And so we need to make sure that we are guarding ourselves and arming ourselves for the campaign. Um, what we take note of is that um, Kepher writes in his first letter in chapter 4, verse 1 to 2, it says, Therefore, since Messiah suffered in the flesh... Arm yourselves also with the same mind, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so that he no longer lives the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but according to the desire of Elohim. In other words, what's ruling you? What's driving you? What's steering your thoughts, your decisions? Is it Elohim or is it the lust of the flesh? Is it possessions? You know? And we are to have the mind of Messiah. We are to think like he thought. We are to meditate and have the proper intentions of the heart secure according to his word, you know. One of the things that we see here when he says have the mind of Messiah, it comes from two root words in Greek. Well, the mind is enoia, coming from en, which is a preposition that means in or by or with, and nous, which means mind, understanding, reason, or intellect. And this word enoia um, that Kepha uses is only used twice in Scripture. What I've just read from when he says we are to have the mind of Messiah and also translated as intentions in Hebrews 4 when it says well, the word of Elohim is living and working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirit and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. In other words, the word can judge your mind, your intellect, your intentions. How often do you allow the word to do that? And you can only do that when you're spending time in the word. When there's something, how many times we find people when they've got a focus in their mind of what they want, the word's the last thing they're interested in right now. When the word should be getting deep down into it to divide the set apart from the profane, the clean and the unclean, so that you can distinguish, is this really necessary? Is it of Yahweh or is this of me? and my fleshly ways. And to arm ourselves with the mind of Messiah, to be armed, that Greek word hoplizo means to arm oneself or furnish with arms, or it also has the meaning take on the same mind. Then we think of the armor of Elohim with the helmet of deliverance. You get this picture. He uses the imagery of a Roman soldier because it was very vivid to the readers of the time, but it actually traces back to the garments of the high priest with the turban that says set apart to Yahweh you know, and the belt of truth, the girdle around his waist, the breastplate of righteousness, etc. This Greek word hoplon, which um, it, where we get the, the word hoplizo, which means armed from, um, hoplon is a word that means a tool, an implement, an ins or a piece of armor or a weapon, and it's a tool or instrument that's used to prepare something. So you don't go out to do something without the necessary tools, correct? I know some of you have tried that, but how far did you get? <laughs> Romans 6 verse 12 to 13 says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body to obey it in its desires. Neither present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to Elohim as being alive from the dead as and your members as instruments of righteousness to Elohim. Again, it's translated as armor. So there we see it as instruments. And this word again, hoplon, is translated as armor is in his letter to the Romans saying, the night is far advanced, the day has come near. Let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. In other words, be equipped. That's really what's with the truth. It's also translated as weapons because he says in Corinthians, for the weapons that we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for, the over, for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings in every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, 
taking captive every thought to make it obedient to Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Okay, Rene Hoplite is a citizen soldier of ancient Greek. Okay, so one who was armed, okay, coming from Hoplon. So a Hoplite, or Hoplite, not Hoplite. Hoplite was a, a soldier, you know, a Greek soldier. But what I'm emphasizing here, why I've gone into some of these things about arming yourself and having things, this is a gain. It's not fleshly things that we're talking. That's what Shaul was saying, because often we, we try and interpret because we read of the fleshly battles that we just read when they went out and killed the kings. And then we think we've got we to act in the flesh to take our stand. And he's saying that's not the battle that we're fighting against. We're battling against inside here, the intellect, the mind, the emotions. That's where the word has to get right down to divide so that we can stand secure in the master, have the mind of the Messiah, you know, and ultimately ask ourselves the question when looking into the mirror of the word, when, you know, whether our minds are as Messiah's or not, or better put, is my attitude right? Because we can't say we're representing the master when we're going out all grumpy and moaning about everything in the world. That's not Yeshua sure didn't go along moaning and groaning about the state of the hypocrisy. He rebuked them. But his attitude is the attitude we ought to have. And that is about the rain that's coming and how we ought to live and shine by it and not being affected by the persecution that comes as a result of it. You know? Maybe you're in that car. Yes. And the kingdom isn't here yet. It's in no. heaven. Yeah. That's why it's about to fall the whole you have to separate that. You have to separate you that. You can't fight the, with a sword. No, a physical sword, yes. Kingdom that's in control right, right now. Yeah. You can't fight the world with what the world uses to fight you. And so that's where, in order to have the same mind of Messiah, we have to be ready to be armed to suffer in the flesh. That's what, that's what he writes to us. Um, to suffer as a good soldier, for he himself suffered in the flesh, and he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, I just want to touch on that before we close for lunch. The Greek word for suffered is pascho, which means be vexed, be affected, endure sufferings. It's used 42 times in 41 verses in the renewed writings, and mostly it's used in reference to Messiah himself who suffered for us. A suffering that he had to go through as it was written. Lucas 24 verse 26 says, Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these and to enter into the esteem? Acts 3 verse 18 says, But this is how Elohim has filled what had been announced beforehand through the mouth of all the prophets, that this Messiah was to suffer. In Acts 9 verse 16 it says, For I shall show him how much he has to suffer for my name. That's what Kepha was told, you know. Or Shaul was told, sorry, not Kepha. Shaul, once he was had his eyes blinded and opened again, he was, he was, I mean, Shaul suffered a lot. Shipwrecked, imprisoned, beaten, chained, left for dead a couple of times, still went back, dusted off the blood, <laughs> dusted off the blood, went back, <laughs> give me more, you know. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26 says, And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is esteemed, all the members rejoice with it. We're in this together. You know, Philippians 1 verse 27 to 30 says, Only behave yourselves worthily of the good news. I mean, we could just stop with that. That's what it all comes about. Behave yourself worthily of the good news. Don't go out and be a fool. Behave yourselves worthily of the good news of Messiah in order that whether I come and see you or am absent, this is what Shaul was writing to the believers in Philippi, I hear about you that you stand fast in one spirit with one being, striving together for the belief of the good news without being frightened in any way by those who oppose, which to them truly is a proof of destruction. The fact that you're not being frightened by them is proof of their destruction that's coming. You ever thought about it like that? But to you of deliverance, and that from Elohim, because to you it's been given as a favor on behalf of Messiah, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same struggle which you saw in me and now here to be in me. 
1 Peter 2 verse 20 to 21 says, For what credit is there in enduring a beating when you sin? In other words, there's nothing to be, oh, you know, look what they did to me. When you broke the law, oh, look what they tried to do to me. That's not, there's no credit for that. What are you trying to do? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure, this finds favor with Elohim. Why are you trying to find favor with man? That's what a lot of people are trying to do. For to you, this you were called, because Messiah also suffered for us, leaving for us an example that you should follow his steps. And Kepha writes again, but even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, neither be troubled, but set apart Yahweh your Elohim in your hearts and always be ready to give an answer for the reason to everyone asking you a reason concerning the expectation that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience so that when they speak against you as doers of evil, those who falsely accuse you of your good behavior in Messiah shall be ashamed. For it is better if it is the desire of Elohim to suffer for doing good than for doing evil, because even the Messiah once suffered for the sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to Elohim, having been put to death indeed in flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And when we consider this passage and the writings of Kepha, we also recognize that Messiah suffered in the flesh. We better arm ourselves with the same mind. And so we ask ourselves as we look into the word, how is my mind? How is my attitude? Am I all grumpy and worked up because of the evil of this world? Or am I standing firm in the confident belief and praise of my master that's called me out of that junk, given me an ability to stand as I sojourn here, and I'm going to guard this truth. I'm going to guard this joy because I know my reward's coming if I hold on, if I keep clinging. We need to think like Messiah. We need to walk like Messiah walked. And we need to love like Messiah loved. How is your attitude towards sin is a question that you need to ask yourself. Because if you hate sin, you won't do it. But you know, people say, yeah, no, I know I shouldn't sin, but they do what they shouldn't do. Then they don't hate that sin. Have you in the intent of your mind ceased from sin? Because we read earlier from 1 John, he who is in the master does not sin. So if you find yourself sinning, then you know you're not in the master at that moment. Everyone staying in him does not sin. So the key is to stay in him. Now, sin is lawlessness. So when you find yourself being lawless, you're not in the master. You're not representing him. You're not shining his light. You're shining rebellion, which doesn't shine. It's darkness. Yochanan Aleph 5 verse 18 says, We know that everyone having been born of Elohim does not sin, but the one having been born of Elohim guards himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. That's a promise. But it comes with the responsibility of guarding yourself. Do you know? Kepha makes it clear, have the same mind of Messiah. And what we learn from this here, when we have the mind of Messiah, our yes will be yes, our no will be no, and our promises and vows to Yahweh will be upheld. That's what it comes down to. And the reality of your sin will find you out. If you keep making empty promises, just know today your, 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 what's going to happen to you. It will find you out. Moshe commands them to go and do what they promised. They went, they did it. A wonderful lesson for us. But as Kalin said, it came at a cost to be years away from your family and that which you, you know, they saw the, it's like Lot. He saw the good land and he said, I want that. And he ended up having to escape very quickly out of it. We shouldn't look with the, the, the eyes of the flesh. We should always have Yahweh directing us and be content in all matters. That's what it comes down to. Anybody want to share their thoughts on today's reading? Before we close for lunch, it's a couple of minutes. I do have a question. Do you want to put the mic there by Ricardo? Yes. So we're obviously reading about the, the tribes today, you know, and how they went out to war and things like that. And um, we know also the wilderness journeys. Um, even during the 40 years of the wilderness journey, there was order in Yahweh's encampment. Yes. So there was a specific design and specific way of doing things. Mm. And when I, when I just look at the, the tribal allotments at the back of the scripture, then I'm thinking of um, 
when what we just read about the uh, tribe of Reuben and Gad and of the tribe of Manasseh, telling Moshe that they will be going out, you know, and fighting. They will be the leading tribe to fight against their enemies. But wouldn't that go against the order of Yahweh? Because um, if I read in Numbers 10, it says from verse 14, And the banner of the camp of the children of Yehuda departed first, according to their divisions, and over their army was Nachshon, son of Aminadab. And when I compare that to the back of the scripture, I can see that the way of departure was from right to left, yes. according to the tribes. Yeah. And um, I'm just thinking now, if the, the tribe of Reuben and Gad and after the tribe of Nashi wanted to go out first before their brothers, wouldn't that be a disturbance to the departures of the tribes? Well, I think the command that was given by Moshe and well, made as a commitment by them is not necessarily an encampment thing because they would still pick up the tents and go as required and tent down as required. But when it's an interesting picture that you pick up here when you look at this because ultimately with Reuben Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh now making their stay on the east of the Yarden, it does affect the design of the encampment. So it goes against them because if you take the south side, I mean, that's Gad, Benjamin, and Reuven. So if Gad and Reuven are no longer there, you only had on the south side, um, uh, uh, sorry, Shimon, yeah, Gad, Shimon, and Reuven. So you only had Shimon left, one out of three. And then the, the, the west side, You'd, Manasseh would be gone. So it would be, only be two out of the three, ultimately. So it does weaken the, the, the tribal allotment. But this, what we, what we take note of, like Kalim is saying, there were consequences that came with this. Like Yahweh's not forcing anybody. He gives a pattern. Mm. I mean, that, that, that was for the wilderness journey. Yes. The yes. 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 Now you're going over you in the land, they had to pass off for yes. what they got. Mm. So that was uh, no. around the tabernacle. No. Mm. But, it, but you, you do see the design, and I like the picture you're thinking of, but when they crossed the yard and it was no longer this encampment pattern that happened. Yes. This was as they journeyed through mm. the wilderness. But it does give an idea of that pattern mindset of weakening or creating breaches or possible breaches. So with them saying we'll go ahead, they weren't breaking the pattern because that pattern of the tabernacle is now for the wilderness journey. I mean, going forward, yes. Going, but it does. Now, I'll be in the front line of every war that we do. Yes. Most dangerous. Yeah. So, they made this promise, but they didn't really think about it. Yeah. Mm. And if you, I mean, we can, we can even go a little bit further. People making such a commitment, and we see in Yahashua that they can go back now. But ultimately, they didn't actually, I mean, Israel didn't drive out all the ites. <laughs> so Reuben, Gad, and half the tribe of Manasseh that should have been leading the fight didn't actually lead it successfully. Because all the seven ites weren't destroyed completely. So we do see through the whole picture how serious our words and commitments are. And... Are we making them based on what we see physically or are we putting our trust in Yahweh and letting him lead us? Because Yahweh doesn't force anybody to follow him. When he said to his taught ones when he was here, come follow me, they left and they followed. They didn't have to follow. When the 70 were following him, but then they came back with great reports, he says, don't, don't marvel that the demons are subject to you in my name. Marvel that your name's written in the heavens. And then when he said, unless you eat of me and drink of me, you have no part of me, they couldn't follow anymore. He didn't say, hey, but you already started. He's not. He wants followers, not fans. He wants people that are committed to him to obey, not thinking they're doing a sacrifice. Because people will obey because, oh, you know, I'm laying, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm giving up something. Yes, you are. But if your attitude is, oh, you know, I can't do that anymore, it's a sacrifice, then you haven't died to self. Because when you've died to self, that which the old man did is no longer even something that you can't do anymore. It's something that you will never do again. So it comes down to attitude and response to his delivering work that continues in your life. So I think the point that you're asking about the encampments and stuff is that it comes down to there's consequences for the 
decisions they made, which ultimately was based on a fleshly outlook. Hmm. Okay, does that... Okay, we're all ready for lunch. Or breakfast in the States. Let's pray. Master Yahweh, we bless you and praise you and thank you that even as we look at these words given to the tribes, then we, we can clearly see the design of your word representing you as our head and we your body, branches of, of the vine being grafted in by your blood as we stretch out and bear fruit of righteousness, fruit that lasts, we can only do so when we stay in you. Because when we stay in you, sin and lawlessness will not be any effect in our lives. We pray, Master Yahweh, that you would help us see the great lessons that we can see through your word today, the wonders of who you are in us, so that we can guard our mouths from speaking falsehood from speaking deceit or bringing your name to naught in false promises and yeses being noes and noes being yeses but let let us stand true to your truth and hold fast the commitment that we've made at our confession of you being our husband our redeemer our savior and king we thank you that you've given us everything that we need for life and reverence you've given us the ability to be dressed in the righteousness that you've given us from above and to guard your truth with everything that we have. May we be ardent as Pinchas was in leading the charge of fighting the belief, the good, waging the campaign, the good belief fight that we are to walk in each and every day as we stand upon you, the rock of our deliverance, lifting up a banner of praise continually to you who fights for us. Thank you that we can share in a Sabbath meal. And just getting to share in a Sabbath meal is a victory meal in itself as we celebrate the victory that you brought us and that you continue to allow us to experience every single day, that we get to celebrate this in your presence every Shabbat as a set-apart people. We praise you, bless you, and exalt you in the name of Yeshua. Amen and Amen.